It is 7.02. I'll call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on February 19th. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as uh, presented. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda with four uh, consent uh, items. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the consent agenda is approved as written. Next we have the public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warned agenda is welcome to come up. I ask that you keep your comments uh, to three minutes. Anything more than that, we'd be glad to put it on uh, the agenda for a subsequent meeting. Anyone online? Roger. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Um, in the interest of having so many attendees, thank you all for being here. Um, I will use public announcements to just note that our planning commission is having a public hearing tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at the Steel Community Room back at the municipal offices. It's on updates to our development bylaws for the area in Waterbury between the Winooski River and Interstate 89 including but not limited to where we're currently sitting in the downtown, but also following that whole extent throughout town. This is the first of two public inputs. It's an opportunity to share, um, hear from the Planning Commission about the work they're doing and also provide input. There'll be another hearing on Thursday, March 14th, also at 6 at the Steel Community Room. They'll be recorded if you're not able to uh, attend at those times, and you can also provide feedback to the Planning Commission. It's on the banner on the homepage of the Waterbury BT website um, with all the maps and relevant materials. And I hope just as many folks <laughs> will be out with me at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Is it also meant to be online no. participation? No, only in person. Okay, thank no, you. Roger, yeah. did, did you just suggest that we could come up and speak at this point in reference to the Armory issue? No, the armory <laughs> issue is on the warned agenda, so okay, anything sorry. not on the warned agenda, and you will have an opportunity to come forward. All right, uh, I would like to thank Martha and uh, the, uh, the Planning Commission for the work that they've done on that, and I uh, wish you a good meeting tomorrow. Thank you. All right, anyone else? either here, uh, we have about 50 people in the audience here, we have about 30 on the uh, 55. 55, keeps growing, <laughs> uh, 55 online. Anyone else want to address anything not on the warned agenda? Okay. <clears throat> Next on the agenda we have an update on the armory building. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, back uh, Commissioner Chris Winters, uh, who addressed us uh, approximately <coughs> a month ago. Uh, and uh, we've got Miranda Gray and uh, Lily Sojourner. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, I was going to ask that you speak from the podium, uh, but if that isn't going to work for all of you, we can make other arrangements. Um, Mr. Chairman, I could speak from the podium. There may be some questions that are more appropriate for either Miranda or Lily, and maybe I could just call them up as needed or pitch to the audience if they can speak from here, whichever you prefer. Yeah, I think uh, I'd prefer them to speak on, from the microphone. Uh, we've had some problems in the past with people not being able to hear. The microphone should be working. Again, uh, I'd like to... Uh, have uh, Chris occupy the floor. Anyone uh, that has comments will be given an opportunity to talk. We've got a good amount of time for this item until uh, 8.30 p.m. 
All right. Uh, and Chris, just to get started, uh, I think you did receive a letter uh, from our town manager as well as from uh, our uh, representative, uh, Teresa Wood. And uh, I wanted to make sure that you received uh, both those letters uh, because we'd Thank like you, you to address uh, many of the items that were uh, addressed in, the, in those letters. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, should I do that? Should we walk through the letter? Would that be the, the best way to do that or hit some high points? Uh, what if, I don't know if you have any prepared remarks based on uh, what you said and what you heard last time. Uh, sure. You could start with that and then perhaps we could get into the letter. Okay. Uh, thank you and thanks for having us back uh, three weeks later. Um, I, I do want to start off my remarks by saying I've heard a lot from a lot of people, from a lot of you. I've read uh, some of the things that have been posted online, published opinions, uh, letters, uh, and articles. And one of the overall themes that I, that I do keep hearing is that this feels rushed. And I think it feels rushed because it is rushed. We, we do have an urgent need, and it's not just Waterbury, and it's not even just Vermont. I think you all can you can look around the state, you can look around the country and understand that we're facing unprecedented levels of homelessness, not just here in Waterbury, not just in Montpelier or Burlington or, or in other places in Vermont, but in other surrounding states and across the country. We need more housing units. We need especially more affordable housing units and a more affordable housing market overall. Uh, in, inflation has been has hit people really hard. Uh, Post-COVID, a lot of the federal funding for uh, poverty programs has dried up. Uh, people are, are really facing some tough times out there. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is, is uh, to help them be housed. And a more affordable housing market overall is going to be one of the ways to get there. But that's going to take time. And as I said the last time I was here, we're trying to make some other options available in the meantime. Um, it's, it's kind of an all hands on deck moment across the state. And we are, are scrambling, you know, to put it mildly, to put together projects, to put together shelter for people who need it. Uh, this project here in Waterbury is just one part of that effort. We're in, we are engaged across the state. And there's a lot of concern that why, why are you choosing Waterbury? Why are you bringing this here? Um, we don't have services here. We've never had a shelter here. Why is this coming to Waterbury? We are trying really hard across the state. Bennington, Brattleboro, Rutland, Barrie, Montpelier, Burlington, St. Albans, Hyde Park. These are all places where we have shelters. I'm sorry? All right. I, I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. They have police forces. Okay. Um, and don't have a Hyde Park, St. John's Barry, Hartford, Springfield, Middlebury. These are all places where we're trying to stand up shelters, or we have stood up shelters. We know that this is not ideal to the, to the person's point here. You don't have a police force. It's uh, not located right next to services. Um, you don't have a food bank. You don't have a soup kitchen. Um, <coughs> It is not ideal, I'll admit that. We prefer more permanent solutions that are proposed and run by local community providers. That's the ideal. But despite our outreach over the last year to try to push some of these other providers to step forward, we've seen an increase of about 80 new shelter beds across the state in the last year. Uh, and we're proposing about 100 more that we think will come online in the next year. So that's 180 more to the about 450 that we had across the state. Uh, so we're moving very quickly to try to get extra capacity up and running, but meanwhile we're using the hotel motel program that I think um, many of you are, are familiar with. Uh, we use 1,600 rooms across the state in the hotel motel program. And as of last June, a number of folks who are considered vulnerable uh, or in catastrophic situations had their stays in those hotels extended uh, by the legislature and signed by the governor um, from June until April 1st. So that's been our target, is trying to get some, some additional shelter capacity stood up on April 1st. And so Waterbury wasn't our first choice. I don't even think it was our second choice in central Vermont. But 
things came, we thought we had something, it fell through. We thought we had something else, it fell through. So we are moving very, very quickly uh, to get this extra capacity online for people who need a roof over their heads. So it's not a perfect plan, it's not our first choice, it's probably not someone else's first choice to have to stay in the armory as opposed to uh, a, a non-congregate shelter or even a hotel room, but we have to make some other options work. And we want this to be successful, not just for the people that we're trying to help, but for the communities we're working in. It's not just about Waterbury. We don't want this to fail. We have to be able to site shelters in other towns across the state. So if this goes poorly, that's a black mark on the state to be able to go and do it again somewhere else. And we're going to need to be doing this across the state over the next couple of years until we can get more traditional shelter beds, until we can get more affordable housing and have less people unsheltered and needing a roof over their heads. Um, so that, and to speak to the timeline is another, I think, concern that people have. I've, I've described this as a three month project. I've described this as temporary. Our goal has always been April 1st to July 1st, but the legislature might move this deadline. There's some work happening in the legislature right now um, that may extend hotel stays, that may change funding. Uh, but the bottom line is we still need more shelter and we still need options other than hotels. So not knowing what the legislature might do or the budget that we might have to work with or how many hotel beds or new beds and other forms are gonna be coming online, uh, April 1st, I'll say, is not a hard and fast date at this point. We're not sure what that's gonna be, but we do know that we need more temporary shelter capacity. Um, and we've been trying to get this up for April 1st to July 1st, and the Armory was a property that was available to us. Um, we could um, fit it up relatively cheaply. And speaking of cost, this is another thing, another one of the questions in Tom Lights's letter. It is going to be really expensive to operate the armory. Um, it's gonna be more per night than a hotel. I know a lot of people have said, look at the purchase price and look at the number of nights. I would encourage you not to look at the purchase price because that's an asset for the state and the Buildings and General Services Commissioner has said to me, there may be other uses, for, there will be other state uses for it. So that's an asset going forward. So as far as this temporary shelter plan, I wouldn't count uh, the cost of purchase and the overall cost of that. It's the operational cost, which is the staffing, which is bringing in food, um, which is, could be transportation, it could be security. All of those costs are the things that go in, into the costs of running a shelter at the armory. Um, and that does make it an expensive project. And so I think that's another reason why this is not going to be a long-term <coughs> ongoing operation at the armory because it is more expensive than hotels and motels, but we do need that option, we do need that bridge for now. Um, shelter management, there have been a lot of questions about that. How is this going to be operated? Uh, the interim director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, Lily Sojourner, is here to be able to answer your questions about how these shelters are typically run. She's got a lot of experience working with other shelter providers across the state, sort of rules they follow, the standards they have. Uh, there's been a lot of concern that this might be just an overnight shelter and so people will be kicked out during the day. Our plan is to operate that as a 24 seven shelter so they can stay in. But uh, let's be honest, these are individuals with freedom of choice and freedom of movement and, and so they may go outside for a walk. They may want to go to the park. They may want to go to the grocery store. Um, so that there will be people coming um, in and out of the armory, but we're not forcing them out during the day. They can stay in, in the armory during the day. Um, shel the shelter management itself is going to be overseen by the state. We are having to contract with an outside provider. There has been some question about whether we could get a local provider to do that. We're in a conversation with a local provider to run it, someone who knows Vermont better, who knows uh, the run, uh, how to run a shelter, who might be familiar with Central Vermont. Um, and then we may also hire a, a state physician, but our plan is to have a shelter operator there every <coughs> single day, in addition to the outside provider um, that we're looking at contracting with. We're still reviewing bids. Uh, we have four, I think, interested providers who would run that shelter. We're looking at, at at least two positions 24 seven plus other uh, <coughs> other staff on site during the day, case managers. 
services? That's another question that was in uh, Mr. Lights's letter. Like, what kind of services are folks going to get at this shelter? Um, the people we are placing, we would plan to place in this shelter, are those we've been working with in this hotel motel program. They're in this cohort that's been there since June 30th and are scheduled to exit April 1st uh, if there's not some other action by the legislature. These are people we know. These are people who've been relatively stable in the hotel program. If they violate the hotel's rules, they get kicked out. So these are people who've lasted since June, who have not been breaking the rules, who have not gotten kicked out. Um, who have been working with us. We have case managers who've been working with them, housing navigators who've been working with them. So they are already connected to services. Our plan would be to continue to connect those folks to services and hopefully move them out of this shelter into something more permanent. That's been the goal for these folks the whole time. Um, and we will try to assist them if we can. Another question was, is there, what's your discharge procedures? So concerned that if someone breaks the rules of the armory shelter, do we just kick them out and lock the door behind them and say good luck? Um, we try to assist them. The standards of a shelter would be to try to assist them if we can, to try to assist them with other services, to try to not exit someone without a plan. But again, being completely honest, if they are a danger to someone else in the shelter, if they're causing a lot of disruption and making it impossible for the other people who are trying to stay there, we will call law enforcement. So I know that's another question that you all have had is the <coughs> impact on law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be times that that'll happen. It doesn't happen a lot from our experience, from Lily's experience in seeing other shelters. This is not the same as a low barrier shelter <coughs> where someone could walk in off the street. They might be <coughs> using substances. They accept all comers. There's a few shelters like that across the state. This is not that. These are folks who've been in the hotel motel program. They're relatively stable. They are going to live by the rules of the shelter as determined by the provider, as overseen by the state. Uh, so absolutely no guarantees that there won't ever be a problem. You know, try living in it with, with 40 roommates and see if anything, you know, nothing ever goes wrong. Um, but we are, are, are fairly confident that it's not going to be significant disruption uh, given the people that we're putting in there. Um, I'm just trying to think of other things, Tom, from the letter that I should touch on. I haven't walked, I'm kind of doing this sort of off the top of my head here, not going through your letter. Um, the, as far as law enforcement goes, we have been in touch with our commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, is talking with the Vermont State Police. I know the local Berlin. Um, uh, unit is aware of this project, um, but I don't have anything more to report on conversations with law enforcement yet. It's really, as I said, hard to know how often law enforcement would be needed, but with most shelters, it's not a lot. Um, I know there would be an impact on first responders and emergency services. We understand that could create more calls for your volunteer ambulance service. Uh, I do have an, uh, an email from your uh, emergency services uh, ambulance service and I do need to follow up to, to make the connection there. Again, our group of people that we would be placing there are connected through um, the VCCI nurses, the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative nurses. So as part of their case management plan, they do have some connection to healthcare. Uh, so hopefully they're following that sort of um, medical plan and already have that in place. Um, and so I think that would limit the number of uh, emergency calls that we might get, but again, as I've said, these were, we're not placing families with children there. Uh, we are looking at a large number of people in the cohort who are either elderly, 60 uh, years of, of age or older, um, or have disabilities. Um, so with that, obviously comes some uh, medical complications at times, and so it would be an additional, um, an additional stressor on your local uh, first responders. I know there is some concern about the location being in proximity to school. Um, and we know that, I you know, of course know that the elementary school is uh, across the river and, and, and through the woods right there um, and w within sight of the armory. I can, I totally understand where this concern comes from. I can actually remember when my kids were in elementary school in 
for the land, and the new state hospital was being sited within a mile of the elementary school. And there were a lot of folks who were really, really concerned and upset about that. Um, Lily reminded me, she's also a Berlin resident, that when that sighting was taking place, some folks from Waterbury actually came and, and, and spoke to the select board and spoke to the town residents saying, it's gonna be all right. <laughs> um, there, aren't a, there, there aren't a lot of problems that go along with the state hospital. People become a part of your community. Um, you know, there's an issue from, from time to time, but it really um, is not something that people should have a lot of fear about. Um, so we are happy to connect with the school uh, to make sure that their concerns are addressed, that there's awareness there. Um, and I, you know, I understand that there may be some kids that are, uh, that are in that area down around the river um, and in the fields down below the armory. We do classes there. Um, so it's, it's good to be aware of that. Uh, the folks who are in the armory, um, they are likely to be older folks, they're likely to be disabled folks, they're likely to be a lot like you and me. Um, there was some concern about walk-ups to the armory and maybe this becoming a magnet for uh, people who are experiencing homelessness coming here thinking that they could get shelter. Our plans are for this to be a referral service out of the hotel so there aren't any walk-ins or walk-ups. Uh, I think to that extent the, the location um, and distance uh, is, is a, an advantage or a, a natural deterrent, but we can't say that that won't happen. Uh, of course, someone could show up um, and we would do our best to assist them in finding other shelter, but this is not going to be a, a walk-in. Uh, we don't want to encourage people to come here thinking that they can get it back for the night. Um, transportation, I guess, is the, is the last thing that I'll address, and I'm sure I've missed some things, Tom, and, and folks will have lots of questions, I'm sure. Uh, but part of our planning process is determining if we'll provide it, we'll attempt to get a stop on the bus line. Some shelters actually purchase a van and, and shuttle people to the appointments that they have if they don't have transportation of their own. Um, so that's still something that's, that's in process. Um, I guess just in, in closing, before we you know, start taking questions or, or um, yield some additional questions that I might have missed from Tom's letter is just to understand that we want this to work. It's my hope that this is a project, a temporary project that could be welcomed by the community. That, that the folks who are here uh, who might go for a walk, might go get groceries, might go to the park, might go to the library, could be welcomed by the community and accepted and respected as individuals and even offered some help if that's something that they were interested in. Um, you're very fortunate to have two representatives who are the chairs for, for the housing committee and for the human services committee that's been dealing with homelessness. And they have a lot of experience with this and a lot of knowledge and they hear from the people directly who are affected by this. And Representative Wood did something last week and had a number of folks in her committee on Friday who were living in hotels and heard directly from their experiences. I really recommend you watch that. I watched it over the weekend. These are people I had spoken to before when I visited Dublin. Each one of them has a compelling story of, of hardship and they're trying to get to a better place in their lives with more permanent housing. And I really hope that with a, with a, with a little work that this shelter site well, again, it's not ideal, and it's not something that's going to be long-term, would be a temporary stop for some of these folks, and get them to that next step toward permanent housing. I know this is asking a lot of your community, and I know you have a lot of concerns about it. I, don't, I didn't get into this work, and I don't think Lily or Miranda did either, just for the paycheck, or just to, just to, to not have something like this succeed. So we are going to do our damnedest to make sure that the community is understanding what we're trying to do, is a part of the solution, and if you have concerns, we want to try to address them, we want to try to make this work. Um, so I appreciate you all being out here tonight. I know you're gonna have some hard questions for me. I'll answer them the best I can, um, but I really hope 
uh, that you can think about this for a moment and how Waterbury can be a part of the solution. Um, it's, it's something that's gonna take all of us and it's gonna take some time before we get back to a place where we don't have this level of homelessness in Vermont. Thanks. Chris, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with uh, questions from uh, the select board and uh, our town manager, and then we'll open it up to a larger, uh, to a larger audience. Um, I have a question. Um, when I was in college, I worked at Pine Street Inn for homeless men in Boston. It's probably the largest congregate shelter in New England. Um, and as you stated yourself, it's not an ideal situation. And I'm wondering why you abandoned uh, pursuing the Econo Lodge, which is set up for lodging, uh, and apparently was interested in working with you, uh, as opposed to trying to transform uh, a place that was built to store ordnance, not human beings. I, I don't want to speak for the, the local provider there in, in Montpelier because they're doing a lot of great work and they have a lot of irons in the fire, but. Um, it's my understanding that we, we thought we were going to do that. Um, it's my understanding that their board voted against it because uh, they were, it was gonna stretch the organization too thin and that they wanted something longer term than I think the 12 months that we were, six months that we were proposing. Um, in addition, the hotel owner was uh, seeking a, a, a pretty steep rate still, less than, than what he's charging the state right now, but still a somewhat steep rate. We would have loved to have gone forward with that. Um, we didn't abandon it. It was the, the provider was not able to make it work. Other questions? Mike. Chris, is, is, is the state willing to sign an agreement that this is going to be a 90-day proposal, not longer? You know, I think we could look at that. I, I would be hesitant to lock into 90 days, which is what I've said before. It might not start on April 1st. If we get to 90 days, I would love to come back and see how it's going. Like, is this, is there, are there no problems? Is this going great? Sure, let's keep it going. Um, but if not, you know, maybe, then, then we shouldn't continue it if, it, if yeah. it's causing problems for the town. Um, there are those limitations in funding um, and limitations in workforce that I think is going to keep us from going uh, much longer than that. But I, I, I can't say to you today it's absolutely only going to be 90 days. Because that's the skepticism within the community. Understood. I know I've worked in public service my whole life too, and I just, you, you get faced with those questions. And sometimes, you know, as we have said before, we're a very welcoming community, but yes, mm -hmm. We would want some sort of agreement. Yes, it would be relooked at after 90 days, or, or or something of that nature. And then, you know, both sides might have you know say, yeah, we think this is working good. But we have said in the past that's an ideal place for long-term affordable housing versus, you know, a shelter. I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, my question is, <clears throat> you referenced more affordable housing four times. Um, and my question is not what the legislature is doing about affordable housing. What is the, what is the administration doing about it? The, the legislature has offered to roll back parts of Act 250 and the administration has threatened to veto it. What is the Scott administration doing about affordable housing? If this is their solution is temporary shelters, that's not a solution to affordable housing. I'm not the housing expert here, but I think um, I think you might be mischaracterizing the that the legislature is is offering to roll back Act 250. And I didn't say in in its proposal. entirety, right? Okay. There's you know. so there are some proposals from the the administration to um, do regulatory reform, tax policy, Act 250, local zoning reforms to encourage affordable housing. That is part of the strategy. Um, and some investments in, in housing. And the legislature has a whole lot of other ideas as well. And I think there's, um, there's something called the Be Home Bill that's in the Senate Economic Development Committee um, that has a number of those reforms. It has pretty significant support from both the administration 
and from Republican and Democratic senators. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Alyssa. Thank you for being here. Um, how do you envision communicating with the town moving forward? I guess I would just say you referenced it as Mr. Lights's letter, and Tom didn't write it as our full-time staff, okay. but it was supposed to be on behalf of the select board in the community. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, from three weeks ago, um, it feels to me like we're in some of the similar places around looking into transportation, looking at four potential out-of-state providers. Again, it feels like we're in this unusual in-between, and personally, I really want to be in a place to um, really support you in helping to support the Vermonters in need of this service and helping to encourage our community members to be supportive, um, but I'm not feeling like I have answers I can point to in that regard, so how do you envision getting that information moving forward? Sure. I'm in, I'm in regular contact with Tom. I assumed it was his letter and his name at the bottom. Of it. <laughs> but I understand it's a compilation of a lot of the questions that have come forward, including from uh, Representative Wood, Representative Stevens, and other community members. And I've received a number additionally, like directly to me. It's been it's been three weeks since I was here last, and as I said, this is very fast moving. We are close to a decision on a provider. Um, we did get those four proposals in. They vary quite a bit in cost and the amount of service provided. Um, so we hope to be able to make a decision on that very soon. And as soon as we do, as soon as we get new information, um, we do update through Tom. If, if you all want to have a different method of communication, you can do that too. Um, but as things are planned and as these things kind of start to uh, crystallize, uh, we're happy to keep the town informed and involve the town in those decisions that um, directly impact you all um, and that where we could use some, some of the town's perspective. So I'm, I'm all for open communication and decision making um, with, with Tom or with others um, as we go and, and happy to keep the board informed as some of these decisions are made. But it's, um, we've got about six weeks, even less, left before April 1st and again that date um, may move, um, but as we make, as we learn new things, as we make decisions, we're happy to, to definitely you know, keep you all involved in that. Danny. Oh, you, do you have another one? Well, I guess I would say, I, I'm not trying to be selfish as an individual board member and just note that like we have, you know, I was CC'd on the communication from the ambulance and just hope that we would be trying to proactively work with them to get answers in the interest of all involved. Again, the goal being the success for folks in the program and the community as a whole. And it just feels like mm -hmm. responsiveness to that is really important. So okay. as we acknowledge, since that hasn't happened yet, that feels paramount to moving forward. Thank you. Um, I have a, a similar comment and then a question maybe that um, you two could help with. Um, my my goal is, is aligned with Alyssa's, being successful in, in all the ways, and also working hard to lower the heat in the conversations. Um, people care deeply for lots of different reasons and in lots of different ways. Um, and some reactions are, are, are in response to feeling um, manipulated and or lied to, to sound a little bit extreme, but people feel really in the dark and they feel like they're getting fed canned responses that don't feel authentic. And then people, lots of people react really distrustfully to that. And so my request is, you know, we, you, you, you said, and you, you were candid in saying, the goal is 90 days and I can't make a promise. And you said that three weeks ago, but today the answer is a little di different. It, my goal is 90 days and then we'll see how it's going. And that felt very different than it did three weeks ago. Okay. And I am personally not angry about that. That makes sense. I had a suspicion that was it all along. But I think when people feel that their experience and their words are not matching up, it gets very heated. And, and I would love to try to cool that because we want to be good partners, just like with the state complex here. We want to be supportive and work together, but at some point that desire diminishes a little bit. And so I'm sorry that was a little long-winded, but I, I want our constituents to hear that. We understand that, and I want that to be heard um, with, with your folks as well. Um, and then the question I have is I know you're still working on the provider, but maybe people who have been there, um, I think a lot of the questions are, are what, what happens there with the operators? What goes on? How do we feel safe? How do these people get taken care of? So as much information as we can have without that actual operator here, I think would be really helpful. Do you want to say something? Mm -hmm. 
to the same way now. <laughs> I'm going to put Lily on the spot. Sorry. But that was like a, a, a lot of experience yeah. with, with, with shelters, and some of you in this room uh, obviously do as well, um, to try to give you just a general sense of how a congregate shelter is run, what might go on there during the day, what sort of services might be provided, what the intake might look like. <laughs> sure, thank you. Hi, I'm Lily Sojourner. I'm at the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, we provide grants to our network of community shelters across the state. And we, it's a very diverse network, so it's hard to kind of speak definitively or with a single answer. But, you know, they have a flow for the day. So, you know, what time are people getting up? Are there morning meals? Um, are there expectations of what folks are doing during the day, trying to um, maintain sort of a safe environment, so if there are places that, um, you know, maybe there's more daytime activities happening, are they having providers come in and out to run um, certain groups, like a recovery group, you know, those things are all scheduled, um, meal times, and then usually having some times at night that are like, okay, you know, we're, we're winding down for the night and we're kind of, um, going to have sort of an ultimate lights out time. So times during the day that it's open and people can, as the commissioner shared, go in and out. You know, they're, they're free to kind of move around. But then at other times, you know, okay, this is when you have to be back. This is when um, we're going to wrap up for the night. This is unique in that the referrals are coming solely from economic services. As the commissioner mentioned, these are folks. So there's not necessarily like a some shelters offer 24-7 intake where you have to be in at certain hours and that's just not at play as currently conceived because it is referrals through economic services from people who are in the program so that would be much more um, controlled than again people who are known and can be referred from that program. I don't think you can. I th it's helpful to know that feel like we had no idea there were like maybe meal times or lights out times. Like that's it's we we have no idea what is going to go on, and so that's it's helpful to have a concept. But I think until there's an operator, we won't we still won't know. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think if people have um, suggestions on what would be helpful or questions about that. You know, I think those are things that we can. Um, take feedback on and, and work with, because we're going to be working very closely with the provider um, to put in place systems that, you know, again, hopefully work for everybody who's involved. Tom, do you have any follow-up questions? I have a question again about the 90-day timeline. Um, I know there's a lot of moving parts. When you presented three weeks ago, uh, Can you speak up? Can you speak up Tom? Sure. So I have a question about the timeline again. Okay. Uh, when you presented three weeks ago, to my recollection, you said there were 1,600 families um, in the hotel motel program, something like 2,300 individuals. Um, you said today there's you're hoping for another 100 shelter beds to come online this year, and I know you're trying to secure hotels permanently as part of that. Um, and I know the legislature's in session and there's a lot of moving parts, but it it just strikes me that no matter how much success you have, you are likely to have a pretty large cohort of homeless individuals for way beyond the 90 days. And I think if you are wildly successful in your job, probably for way beyond a year. So again, I, can you just enunciate on maybe the broader strategy and how you really think you could wind this down? Because it, just based on those numbers, it strikes me as a pretty difficult task. Yeah, thanks. That's that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to do as much as we can with, with what we have. Um, in addition to, to Waterbury, there are a couple of other temporary shelter options that we're, we're pursuing. Uh, one is uh, 20 units in Brattleboro. Um, we're looking at the purchase of a hotel and temporary use as a state hotel in Bennington. We're looking at mobile sites on, on trailer beds. Uh, for Rutland and possibly Burlington. And again, these are all within a, a certain budget that we have and a certain timeline that we're looking at that may move. But the broader strategy is 
one, trying to convert some hotels and motels, which we really have a hard time getting those folks to come to the table, but that's we're being more successful in that due to a, a price cap proposed by the legislature. Um, and trying to show that we can, there are some other options to the hotels and motels out there. Those are some of the quick gains that we could, could have is if we were to be able to purchase something like an Econo Lodge or do a lease agreement that's different than working with the hotels and motels because we're currently paying over $130 a night and that's you know taxpayer money that could be used in a better way if we were paying a lot less or, or doing it through a lease uh, negotiation. Um, the other part of this is the, the new units, the new shelter beds. It's gonna take a while to get all of those things online. We don't know how fast that's gonna happen. And that'll depend on some of the, the housing reforms, some of the Act 250 reforms, some of the local zoning reforms, and whether we can encourage development uh, to get more units in the pipeline. Hopefully more affordable units are, are a big part of that. And again, that depends on, on legislative action and, and administration strategy and all of those things as well. Um, so that's the, the bigger picture, but you are absolutely correct that we are going to continue to fall short. We are not going to be able to house everyone. We never have. Um, and so it's, it's in our faces. It's, uh, we see it in encampments. We see it on the street more now than we ever have before. Um, so this is why Waterbury is, is the armory is one piece of that strategy, an imperfect piece, um, but a temporary bridge to where we get to where there is more affordable housing, there are more traditional shelter beds online with connected services and run by local community providers in places where it makes a lot more sense. If I may. Sure. Um, and this may be a question better for uh, Lilio Miranda. Um, Chris, you had, you had mentioned that um, the individuals you're targeting for the armory have, have essentially been in your program for a number of months. I think you said six months. Um, would you anticipate that the 40 individuals brought to the armory would essentially remain there for the duration? Or would you anticipate a fair amount of turnover? So our, our goal is to move them out of there as quickly as possible, but to keep those beds filled. So to cycle people through to more permanent solutions. We started in June with this uh, cohort. So these were folks who were already in the hotel motel system under the, because they were vulnerable and, and some met one of the eligibility categories. Because they were there on June 1st, they were allowed to stay there. Um, so they may have been there for months even before that. So we've been working with that group. It was almost 1,300 households when it started. We're now at about 580, if I'm correct. So we are, a lot of those folks have found permanent housing. They've found, you know, or they've moved away, or you know, lot, lots of things have happened to those folks. They aren't required to tell us, but we've been assisting them. Uh, for these last six months more intensely with case management, housing navigation services, trying to get them connected. That's the same approach we would take for the folks here uh, in the armory proposal, and we would hope that we can bring them in, intensely case manage, move them out, bring in someone else, and just keep it going. Uh, okay. Uh, my question is, Chris, um, so, I guess I'm being a little speculative here, but if this program goes the way of the hotel motel program, which wasn't supposed to last as long as it has, and we end up with the shelter program for as long as the motel program has survived, is there a stopgap after a, a shelter, or is this the stopgap between being housed and not being housed? I'm not sure that I understand your question, but I, you know, there are a lot of different types of housing, transitional housing, supportive housing, really can speak to some of those. We have a lot of different programs to try to tailor um, the support that we give someone who might be going through unsheltered homelessness. So there's our traditional shelter system, there's the motel system, there's supportive housing, really you want to speak to any of the other programs. We do a lot of rapid rehousing, we do voucher programs to help people stay where they are, people who are on the edge of homelessness. Right. Um, it's just a, a really big network of systems and providers there and supports to try to keep people out of homelessness, divert them from it, or get them rapidly back into rehousing. So this is one you know, very, again, kind of a small piece compared to the bigger picture 
of housing and homelessness. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for being patient. I know a lot of you do have questions. Uh, I'm going to suggest those in the room that want to ask a question get in line coming around this way, uh, and we'll take you one at a time. And then we'll also take people uh, that are uh, wanting to put, ask questions uh, online. So you can come forward over here. Well, thank you. I'm waiting uh, for this question time to come yeah. up. I'm know, sorry, your name? You're short. Oh, when you're, when Barbara, would you mind just one second? Yeah. I just want to go over the expectations before we get started, which sure. in general is please say your name before you start, and then we're going to try to keep everybody to two minutes. And you'll keep the, yes. Keep the clock. Thank right. you. Thanks, Barbara. Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. No problem. I work for government. <laughs> um, <laughs> Two questions. What's your name? You don't need that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Barbara Walton. Okay. Thank you. Here Sorry about that. Um, I have two questions. So what you're saying, Chris, is this is a permanent structure that you're building. So at the end of three months, excuse me, you will be leaving that building and the government has spent thousands of dollars getting it ready for that that three months. Is that correct? So the, the fit up that's happening now is for long-term use for any use. The shelter piece of it is just temporary partitions on the inside and use of some of the offices that are around the outside. And there is a modification to the bathrooms that's happening too. So sprinklering, fire code, bathrooms, but the shelter piece of it is just temporary partitions in that big open space. Well, yeah, I know it. I know that, but people stay longer than, you know, three months. And the other thing is, is there going to be, you're going to leave, it just, it just amazes me the amount of money that's being spent. Not that, you know, homeless people don't deserve this and have compassion and empathy for them. But to spend that kind of money, and then you're going to end closing the shelter part, truly, and so you're just going to have offices in that. I've worked for government, and there isn't any place where I can say that when they spend that kind of money, they don't give it up. They don't let it sit. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's permanent. So what the BGS commissioner has said, and I didn't have this the last time I was here three weeks ago, but she has testified in committee um, that there are a lot of other state uses as a warehouse, as you know, building something else up there. Um, lots of uses beyond this temp. It's not, this is a very temporary partitions on the inside for the shelter space. It's plywood, basically. All right, and the other second question is, uh, last, at last um, meeting, a lady got up and who seemed to be very knowledgeable and said that for a res for a population of 4,000 like we are, that the recommendation would not be for 40 and 50 people in a shelter, or, or but more like 15 or 16, something like that. Why are we having so many based upon the fact that there's studies saying that 4,000 is about you know the residents and then you whatever this formula is you would then say okay we can handle 15 I mean why, why the, the so big why 40 50 people uh, I think 40 is what can reasonably fit in there and then kind of the economies of the staffing patterns and things like that it would be a lot more expensive per person if we did 20 instead of 40 and we've also seen that a 40-person shelter, I think, is is um, the maximum size that you would want in terms of a, uh, especially in terms of a congregate shelter. Well, I just, I'm kind of hesitant um, about it, really, quite hesitant, um, to be honest. Uh, I appreciate you letting me ask the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Sally. Sally Dillon, uh, two things. One, um, is it true that Vermont State College in Montpelier is for sale? That's a dorm setting. That would be a perfect place. It's on our list. Okay. We've looked at it. All right. And secondly, the, I'm sorry, Sally. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what was the first question? 
I just said, the Vermont, is Vermont State College for sale in Montpelier? They already have dorm rooms, they have facilities, they have services, they have full-time public safety. I just think it would be a great place for it. We, we, I just say that we've looked at a very, very long list of buildings across the state. We've been scouring for, for possible locations. And secondly, the people that are currently at the Hilltop since July 1st, are those ones that have met this criteria for um, the disabled or whatever? Is that, is that the people that are there? That could be some of them. There are other motels that we use um, in the okay. very area as well. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm, as far as, but everyone that's at the Hilltop has met this criteria, is that correct? I can't say that that is correct. I would need to see because we have people move in and out, so that means there could be a room that is open and someone could have moved in there under one of my other two programs. Okay, because I just, um, I spoke with Berlin PD with their permission. The amount of times since July 1st that they've been to the Hilltop 169 cases plus 59 directed patrol, which means they go there and actually walk the halls and interact with people to try to deter crime. 169 calls in 182 days is a lot. And I think it's more than our town can handle. And that doesn't count what happens at all the other businesses involving some of those people. So I just think it's, they're not as cream of the crop. And I get there are some people that are good people that are there, but I just think it's gonna be a lot for our law enforcement. Thank you. Can I just yeah, that? You know, in the in the hotel and motel program, it's it's not run by a shelter provider. There aren't the same rules that we would have. Uh, there's not the same control. The state doesn't have a lot of control over the hotel motel program. Uh, we have seen that people who are in that program in the hotels often are victimized by drug dealers, human traffickers, others who move into the hotel. Uh, or are attracted to the hotel, and that's not just hotels, that's any, that's any town, that's any large apartment complex. Um, so I think, you know, the, it's not, a, it's not a, a valid comparison. There, there are additional law enforcement issues, um, but it's not daily like you might have heard from Berlin. I'm not familiar with those stats myself. I live in Berlin. I understand that there uh, were a lot of issues with the hilltop. But this shelter would not be anything like this. Chris, can you, can you define what <coughs> referral means? Because you've used that a couple of times that these are going to be referrals. What constitutes a referral? Yeah, so, um, so Miranda is the Deputy Commissioner of Economic Services, and it's an economic benefit, our emergency housing program uh, for people who we offer a shelter first, so shelter bed first, and if there are no shelters available, you can get a uh, hotel room. And so the referral would come from the state, from economic services, saying these are folks who are in the hotel motel program. These are the people we are trying to actively target and help. Um, we've already been working with them, and so they would be the ones that we would refer uh, to the armory. So referral rather than people like walking up or walking off the street um, and, and being allowed a shelter bed there. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Tamitha Thomas, you have a hand up online. Hi, good evening, Roger, and everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I just have a quick comment as um, someone who lives along the road to the armory um, that, it, you know, a lot of times people don't realize um, how badly we flood and that when we flood, we become an island. And um, you noted that these folks will be um, vulnerable, uh, disabled folks, and I would just want to make sure that whoever operates this um, shelter understands the need for evacuation um, in the case of flooding, especially because no emergency will be able to get in and out or up and down that road. Um, food, nothing. Um, and so I would just want to make sure that they're taken care of in that way. Thank you. Chris? Thank you. Really appreciate that comment. We have looped in our uh, Vermont Emergency Management partners to make sure we have a, an evacuation plan um, and a flooding plan in place for the, for the use of the shelter. Thanks a lot. No, thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Daniel. Um, my first question is I'm confused because you said referral from the hotels, but then you said you don't have any oversight of the hotels and all the terrible things that happen there you have no, that, like, I'm confused by those two pieces of information. Oh, Daniel, Elizabeth. Yeah, I can try, you want me to clarify for me? Yeah, I would okay? 
Chris, um, go ahead and take the microphone. Oh. <laughs> um, so we don't have any control over the, how the hotels are run. We pay for rooms, uh, and then it's up to the rules of the hotel as to how they how they run their operation. Okay, but you said people that haven't been they they haven't been kicked out of the hotels, but you said you have no oversight of the rules. So how do you know they? Why, whether they've been kicked out or not. Yeah, so they, they're still in the hotels. We, we do track that. Who has a voucher to us? If they get exited, we find out. Um, maybe they were disruptive. Maybe they, you know, law enforcement involvement, some, something like that. Um, they do get exited from the hotels, and then they're no longer qualified for the, what we call the June cohort. So that's part of that 1,300 households that are now down to under 600 are people who would have been exited for some reason. So the people who are still in there have been playing by the rules, have been engaged with case management, that's another requirement. But your rules, not the hotel's rules, because you guys have no oversight over the hotel rules. We have no oversight over how the hotels run, run the hotels. You want further clarification? Yeah. Sure, happy to. So um, the motels are in constant communication um, with economic services, and so it is. If someone is being exited, they let economic services know the reason why, and then we do have rules about whether or not someone is going to still be able to have housing um, somewhere else, or if they have a period of ineligibility, which would be 30 days, because they have done something that is um, more egregious, and then we need to have them have a RIC. All right, sorry, that just came up because I was confused. Um, I, Waterbury is an amazing town and we help people and we want this to work, but there are a lot of unknowns. Um, so, and we very much appreciate that you're helping lots of other communities, but I would love it if you would just talk about Waterbury because cool that you're doing stuff other places. We want to know about Waterbury. Um, anyway, uh, also the providers, are they for-profit providers or non-profit providers? You've got four providers, are they? Yeah, I think it's a combination. There might be some that are non-profit, some that are for-profit. Okay. And I will just say, I, I brought up the other towns because I, I have gotten feedback like, why are you doing this to Waterbury? Okay, why, got it. You're not the only ones. <laughs> We're doing this. Um, <laughs> we are trying across the state. Awesome. Excellent. Okay. Um, and then, how will or will they, the profit or nonprofit providers, communicate with our town? So, how are we going to be able to let them know, yep, it's working, or no, it's not? Are they only going to communicate with you guys, and you guys are going to communicate with us, or how is that communication going to happen? <coughs> So I do think that for this to be um, to happen in the most effective way, the provider also has to have a relationship with the town. So I think the providers, once chosen, would need to uh, meet with the town, um, help under help them understand the community, understand what your concerns are, and and hopefully be able to address the questions and concerns that you have as a provider, plus state oversight to make sure that that's happening. Cool. So hopefully you'll meet that person quick. So we have time to do that. All right, and last thing, is there gonna be a kitchen or how are meals gonna be provided? We're looking at having meals brought in, um, just, uh, and so right now we're doing this, then we'll provide the picture to see what that would look like. So in three meals a day. So somebody will, will truck in meals. Yes. Cool. Man, he's been getting a bowl. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I'll recognize uh, Whitney Aldrich online. Whitney, are you there? Thanks. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Roger, and thanks for coming back and giving us more information about this program. One question I have is similar to um, a, a question that just came up about yeah. metrics. Um, I guess my question is how and who will be determining if this is a success and if it's a longer term program? and how is it determined if it's not a success? Like, what are the metrics that are being used to adjust, and um, how do we check in and, and recalibrate things if needed? That's, that's a really great question. I think some of the metrics of yes, the little house guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think 
think you know some of the metrics of success is are are people finding housing? Um, are they healthy? Are they stable? Um, if we're in, in this type of scenario, if we're able to move more people through than we are in the hotel motel program, I think that's a an indication of success. I think some um, indications that it's not a success success will be if the town is, is experiencing problems. So I am I have no doubt that we will hear. Um, if there are some issues with the shelter. Um, and so we'll be you know, listening closely to the town on that and we'll be monitoring our provider and our metrics as far as you know, people moving into more permanent housing situations as a, as a measure of success. Thank you. Hello, my name is Krista Bowdish. Um, so my basic question, as you're describing it, you're looking for a band-aid. You, there's factors that aren't you know, under your control. You, know, you can't just choose to extend the hotel program or whatever. So you're looking for a band-aid that's about 90 days, ish, plus or minus. What is it that, you're, that you think you can accomplish in 90 or 120 or 150 days that is going to eliminate the need for this stopgap solution? Yeah, I don't think we eliminate the need in 90 days. I, I think it's, it's that simple. What we, what we were trying to do, what we have been trying to do, is that when the cohort time ends on April 1st, that we have additional shelter available for when people are exited from hotels. Now that might, might change. Um, what we know is happening right now is we're trying to negotiate lower room rates with hotels, and a number of them are saying, forget it, we're, we're out of here. Um, and that means additional families exited from hotels. Um, so we're trying to put together at least something in the colder spring months to the summer uh, for, for folks who might be exiting the motels in, in March, April, May. It is a short-term solution. It's not perfect. None of these things that we're provo proposing are, are ideal, um, but we're trying to create additional shelter for people who need it in the short term. And this was one property that was available to us and one of many, many solutions that we're trying. But do you have any more specifics on, like, because it's just what are the next things? How do we help get to that? What are the next things that you're trying to? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of things, and they're very much, um, undetermined how successful they will be. There's other shelter beds, there's purchase of hotels and motels, there's lease agreements, there's conversions, there's new housing units coming online. Burlington with, with more housing units is actually having quite a bit of success in moving people out of hotels and into the affordable housing units that are coming available, but you need the units. Um, so I think it's, it's yet to be seen how quickly those units can be built given some of the proposals in the legislature, that might speed things up some. Uh, but I'm not going to argue with you when you say this is a band-aid on, on what's a pretty big wound that we're trying to deal with. All right, thank you. I'll recognize M. Lampson online. All right, um, at the previous meeting, I know Chris had said that he didn't feel there was any permits for the town that were going to be needed. Um, but even just with personal experience with the Development Review Board, and maybe this is more of a question for Tom, um, what is the status of that? Are, is there going to be a change of use permit? What needs to be done um, as far as town permitting? Our position is they need a change of use permit. Um, I understand they have a different position. Um, I believe they have until Friday um, to uh, essentially file an appeal to our initial decision and from there the DRB follows its standard legal process. Um, once the state files their uh, appeal letter, the DRB will have 60 days to have a hearing. Um, provided that hearing is completed in one meeting, they would then have 45 days to issue a decision. And I don't have any knowledge beyond that. And of the, our buildings and general services department and legal department, I guess, are, are handling the permitting piece of it and are working with the town on that. And that is standard process for anyone who would believe needs a permit. And so essentially that puts it well beyond that April 1st deadline that they were hoping for, which is fine with me. I'm just curious on the dates. It doesn't, it, that doesn't calculate to their April 1st deadline. Um, so I'm just, so just kind of curious on that. My just, question. just to be clear, the, the DRB would have 60 days to schedule a hearing. That is a maximum. They can do it faster. They would have 45 days to issue a decision. That is also a maximum. <laughs> 
Thanks. Chris. <coughs> My name's Chris Vian. Many of you know me, some of you don't, probably. Uh, before I start, I'd like to say thanks, Danny, for your comments earlier. Um, so we've, there's been a lot of comments here tonight about kicking this problem into somebody else's lap. Uh, this is nothing short of an epidemic. It's been a poison pill to a lot of communities. Um, I can't quite understand why we continue to address the consequence of a problem as opposed to the cause. In every aspect of many of the issues that we face today, we're always dealing with reactionary, the consequences of an issue, and we're reactionary to it, and by the time we get to it, as you've seen tonight, they're trying to inform us in, in, uh, of a lot of unknowns, but one thing that we do know, if anybody's bothered to pay attention, is somebody said the other night at the last meeting, these are our brothers and sisters. Yes, they are, and I feel for them. What got them in the situation that they're in? And if you look, when we're, supposed to, we're supposed to take them into our lives and help them. Yes, you're right. But I disagree with the way that some of them, some of the help is being handed out. Uh, other communities are starting to get really concerned about this same issue, the drug issue, the home. I know they've been saying, well, these people, many of them are good people, which they probably are. They're not uh, necessarily hooked on drugs. Some may be, some are not. Um, I lost a cousin who was my best friend, like a brother to me, two years ago in May. Still cocaine, fentanyl, overdose. Half a mile road from my house, from Waterbury Center. Chris, you only have 10 seconds left. That's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> if these people, if, if drug dealers, or if these people, where do they get their drugs if they are on drugs? And are they coming, or would they be coming into town to do it? Uh, and is that bringing more drug dealers in and more of the same problem? Other Chris. <laughs> um, I would just say that people who are experiencing homelessness are complicated individuals, just like you and me. Some of them have substance use issues. Some of them have mental health issues, some of them have significant physical health issues. They've often experienced trauma in their lives. Uh, but that's not to say that they should not be accountable for their lives and for their actions. Um, so drug use in a shelter is not tolerated uh, in this uh, armory shelter as it's going to be operated. There's not going to be um, dealing happening on this site, as you might find in some hotels and motels, unfortunately, or apartment complexes or neighborhoods. Um, so I do think this is a this is a slightly different situation. That's not to say that folks here in this in the hotel motel program currently or in the armory aren't going to have complex health, mental health, substance use, and other issues uh, to have to deal with. That's why we wrap them in services. That's why we have case management. That's why we do our best to get them stable and into more permanent housing. Thank you. Roger, Roger. May I uh, okay. just for a moment? Um, I said it at our last gathering over this issue, and I'll reiterate. When I arrived in Waterbury, I was homeless. This is the face of homelessness. Every single person in this room is one bad day away from financial ruin. To cast a wide net and accuse every single homeless person or most homeless people of being drug addicts or dragging drugs into this town is irresponsible. That's all I have. Anyone else with a question? Yeah. Go on. Um, no one here. Um, maybe I'm not clear on this, but does the voters or the select board have a decision on this, or is this something you just like override? Are we just here just listening? Um, 
<coughs> so this is a state-owned property now, and it's a permitted legal use. So the state is planning to proceed. There is permitting that's under dispute in some ways right now, I think, but it, it, there should be um, a legal path to the state being able to use this property as a shelter for this temporary period of time. I'm here to make sure I understand what the concerns of the community are. We want to be good partners. I know it's not your choice. It hasn't been. It's been very little notice, and that's um, not how I would like to operate or how the state would like to operate in this situation. But we're trying to move fast to put up this emergency shelter. Um, so I, we still do want to hear everything that you have to say and try to address all of your concerns. Yeah, I was just trying to see if we have the decision or if the select board had a decision on it. Um, it sounds like they don't, but um, the other question I saw is, like you stated that five times this is not the ideal scenario, not the ideal place you would choose uh, early on. Do you feel like your decision making, being that this is an ideal and you said this is a third option, is this coming down to what the, maybe there is a, a problem with our housing situation because you continue to make a not ideal Decisions, maybe, or what do you think? It's a legitimate question. Um, I think we're trying to do the best that we can with the resources that we have. Uh, we, we've tried a lot of different things, and not all of them pan out. And it's for a lot of different reasons. It's, it's because you know, maybe there's community opposition. Maybe we can't find a building. Maybe we can't find a, a workforce to run it. Uh, maybe we don't have the money. Um, so there needs to be a longer term vision. There needs to be more investment in this because the house, the homelessness problem is growing. Uh, we need to invest in housing and units is, is of course one very important part of this solution. Uh, but we don't love to, to have to make decisions on short term, uh, short term temporary options with very little notice to communities and less than ideal spaces using congregate shelters when you know non-congregate is a better practice. So definitely not ideal all around. Uh, I've said it multiple times and I'll continue to say it, but this is what uh, one option that we can put together that will make a difference for some people for a short period of time. And uh, you know, I'll just clarify that uh, our uh, town zoning administrator has determined that uh, they do uh, require a change of use permit, and they have until Friday to respond. Do they need an active 50 permit group beyond that, or? Well, that's not a town permit, that's a state permit. My, my understanding is they do not. But would an active 50 permit have to do all the butter? They would have to be approved by that. Um, it's, not, it's not a relevant question. They don't need the Act 250 permit. They don't. They do not. And, and if they do, that's a state determination, not a town determination. But my understanding is they do not. Tom, can you clarify what the current use permitting process would look like here in Waterbury? <coughs> in terms of, is there a say about it? I think what he's getting at is that the town people have a say in that process. So, the state would ultimately wind up before the DRB a better determination whether or not they need a permit. If we assume they need a permit from the DRB, there's a legal process there. Um, and that can end a few different ways. Uh, the DRB can, can, can issue a permit or deny the permit. Um, if, if the DRB issues a permit, any person in this room can challenge that decision in environmental court. Uh, what you need to challenge that decision is, I believe, a $300 filing fee. Um, if you challenge that decision, I believe the permit has an automatic 15-day stay. But that said, after 15 days, it goes to court and they can operate the shelter. Uh, if the DRB were to deny the permit, then eventually um, the state could, in fact, be an environmental court against the town. That process takes time. That's a process that would occur in any town, uh, that's simply Vermont state law and following the legal process. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Whitney, I see that you've got your hand up again. Uh, the, we've got other people uh, in the room that have been patient, so I'm gonna call on them first. If we have time, I'll get back to you, okay? Yeah, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Hall, I'm the 
Thank you. I'm Eliza Mabin Smith, I live up in the center. And I think, Chris, you said at the beginning that this is an unprecedented crisis. I think your words exactly were that this is emergent now. I think it feels a little bit, it certainly, well, I won't speak for everyone, it feels hard for me to hear that, given that the, that the state has been paying for folks who are unhoused to live in motels for three, four years now. And I think, separately from folks of us who do have housing in town and do have housing in this state, it feels challenging to hear that on behalf of the folks who are unhoused. Um, I think that they would disagree with your characterization that this is a new emergency. And I think after years of COVID, hearing from state officials and federal government officials, this will only be temporary, this will be three months. Uh, at this point, the experience of the last several years has been what starts as three months is much longer. And I think we have an expectation of knowing what the plan is and not just we will make a plan, we have a hypothetical plan. Your department in family services cannot work with a family and their children without writing a detailed case plan and presenting it to court, identifying obstacles and goals and strengths and putting in writing your commitments to the families that you work with. And I think the state owes it to the town and to taxpayers and to the folks who need housing a plan in writing with specific commitments for what the state is going to do to build out the pipeline so that we won't continue to need to have temporary shelter for three weeks or for three months uh, in perpetuity because if, 10 more seconds left. if there's not anything in the pipeline, three months isn't gonna be enough no matter how hard everyone is trying to make it work. That's really well said. You sound like Representative Wood. <laughs> it's a fair question, like what is the long-term plan and the long-term goal? As far as you know, the last three to four years, I've been, been DCF commissioner for almost a year now. I might feel like three or four. Um, but it's been about a year. And, and before that, you know, during COVID, we did open up the hotel motel program to take people out of congregate shelters and get them into private rooms to protect the most vulnerable, um, especially the elderly. And that was, and then there was federal money that came behind that. So it was very easy to say, let's just keep taking the federal money and keep people in hotels and not really think about what's next. And then they send it again and again. We kept saying it's going on, and then it didn't, it's going on, and then it didn't for three or four years. And now the federal money is gone. And we built this very large hotel motel program. But there really is a housing crisis. It's getting worse and worse, and affordability seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, and the scarcity of moving into affordable apartments is worse and worse. There are a lot of people in the hotel motel program who are not, they don't have substance use issues, they don't have mental health issues, they have jobs, they have no ability to find an affordable apartment, anything that's less than $1,500, $2,000 a month. There just aren't units available. Um, so it, it feels to me like the crisis is getting worse and worse, but it's been a while coming. It's been multiple years coming and building up this hotel and motel <coughs> program through COVID and beyond um, without a plan for what's next. The state deserves a lot of blame for that, for where we are now. Looking at short-term fixes, we need to think longer term to your, to your point. When will that start? I mean, it is starting and, and there are lots of strategies being employed now and lots of small progress in a lot of different places. It's the whole, it's um, Act 250 reform, it's local zoning reform, but it also needs to be how are we building out additional traditional shelters with wraparound supports that are more successful than our hotel motel program. And to your point that um, we should provide the town with a more detailed plan, I absolutely hear that. And, and we should do that, and we will, we will endeavor to do that. We'll give you as much detail as possible, as soon as possible. But I just can't, as I've said multiple times over, I would love to say April 1st to July 1st, here are the people who are coming in, we're gonna be done. Um, I don't wanna sit up here and say that and have that not be true. Um, but we can't go long-term with a temporary, with a, with a shelter, an armory shelter 
that is in not an ideal location and we and it's more expensive than the hotel motel program. That's just not something that's going to be sustainable for the long run. Uh, I'll just note that we've got eight minutes left uh, on the agenda for this, uh, so uh, I'll ask you to try to keep your comments brief and uh, step forward if you have a question. Anyone back here? Yeah. My name is John Allen, um, and uh, I work in Burlington, so I see a lot of the problems with homelessness, and it's not controlled, like you're talking about, as I assume. Um, I see uh, all sorts of uh, really bad behavior, and I don't want that to be duplicated here in Waterbury, because this is a safe place to come to right now. My children come out of here and work in town, and I want to keep it that way. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, I, I've seen where you, know, you have all these people, you know, there's people that you can recognize walking down the street who really are just uh, there for illicit purposes, you know, urbanites from other states walking through and they're not friendly people. And uh, but there's a lot of nice people in Burlington, That's not, I'm not trying to mischaracterize Burlington, but the element exists, they've had a lot of violence there. and so. I would like to ask, how are you going to not have this be a magnet for those uh, 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 people who want to cause trouble here? Um, you know, you talked about your rules. Can you publish those? Yeah. Can you publish the contract with your vendor? Those type of things to give us insurances. And can you come up with criteria for when things are not going well? Uh, whereas, you know, in the community where you need to pull out because things are getting out of hand, not because of the things you're trying to do are wrong, but other people's behavior with your program are causing problems. Um, you know, I lived here in the 70s when they had the state hospital, and, you know, we never had, you know, we had, there was very few problems. Just but a few more seconds, John. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. There are, we do have shelter standards. Um, there are somewhat guidelines, and then the provider themselves will come up with rules for the shelter with the state's input and oversight. And uh, once that RFP is signed, that contract will be a public document. I'm glad to share that with you. Next. Sure. Sorry. Um, I'm just also wanted to add. A couple things. Um, in Burlington and Chittenden County, they estimate there's over 200 individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. I think this is what we want to avoid. We, we want people to be sheltered. We don't want people to be unsheltered. We're facing nationwide a dramatic increase in homelessness and people who are becoming homeless for the first time. And over the past few years, Vermonters have rehoused more people than we have in years preceding, but the demand for this service just keeps growing because of inflation, because of the high cost of housing, because of some of the issues you've mentioned. So I just think that um, that's an important dynamic to realize and that, you know, again, I think what we're really trying to prevent is having more people who are unsheltered because the more people are in housing, that's where you know just, it can be such a launch pad for their health, for their job security, for their children, for their family. Um, so I just wanted to add that and make sure that um, that was part of the conversation. Thank you, Lily. We have unhoused in Waterbury. We have drugs. I'm oh, sorry, we're going to have to respect the line. Next. Hi, my name is Maggie Burke. I'm the director of Waterbury Ambulance Service. Um, I shared an email with Commissioner Winters and Teresa Wood, um, as Alyssa mentioned. I just want to share a couple of the concerns that I have. Um, obviously, we respond 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and provide the same quality care to every single person that we respond to. Um, this proposed facility will house those who are elderly, have disabilities, or are pregnant, as has been mentioned. Um, all these populations in general have a higher contact with emergency services, regardless of whether housed or not. Um, 
we as an ambulance service are struggling financially, just like all rural ambulance services in the nation. We're a nonprofit organization, and we're grateful for the taxpayers who cover just under 30% of our budget. Um, many of these folks are gonna either be uninsured or underinsured um, that are living in this facility. And in other areas, you've got a full-time you know, municipal ambulance service where the taxpayers are gonna absorb those additional costs, where this will fall on our nonprofit to cover those costs for those individuals that we're responding to. I'm also worried about burnout for our crews. Um, we do still have a volunteer service. Um, we have generally one paid person on our truck as well as volunteers. Um, I'm concerned about my crew when they're getting called to the same address repeatedly um, to the same individuals. Um, there's a couple different requests that I have to follow up on. One is being proactive and progressive. Can we use a community integrated mobile health or community paramedicine program where we go down and check on these individuals a couple of weeks, we work with a contractor and are reimbursed for that um, ability to be proactive um, with our, our neighbors. And then also other communities have had success with being reimbursed for each emergency call to the facility. Uh, Berlin's an example. And so could it be followed that the ambulance service would be reimbursed um, for the calls that we go to at this facility? Thank you, Maggie. We'll follow up with you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Hoffman. I've lived in the community for 30 some years. Uh, this is the first time I've ever spoken as a resident at a select board meeting. Um, we live in Waterbury Center, so not won't be directly near this, even though we're in the downtown every day. Um, years ago, my wife and I lived in Brooklyn, and there was a homeless shelter near our house uh, at our church, and we worked um, every few weeks. We work on a you know work night overnight at that shelter, and um, there were a dozen guys that would come there, and it was just Kit and I uh, staffing it overnight. Um, and in so many ways, the people that were there seemed so different than us. You know, they looked different, they were different economically, different color of their skin. Um, but in so many other ways, they were just like us. Uh, and I appreciate that our elected representatives are kicking the tires, putting these people through their paces and asking the tough questions. Um, and I appreciate you good people being here. You'd rather be with your families and you're answering as best you can all, all our questions. I would just hope that we approach this from a, how can we make it work standpoint. And I don't, I don't know that it's the right idea, but I think we should approach this, how would we want to be treated if we were in the predicament of these people? Um, and, you know, we could be, but for the grace of God, we're not. And I would just ask that we approach it, how we can make it work, and how would we want to be treated if we were in their shoes. Thank you. Scott. Uh, Scott Maggie, uh, Waterbury Village. And in the spirit of Rob's comments, I mean, I am concerned about the rush process. We, this thing needs to succeed. And I feel like when you rush something through like this, you ignore all the processes and procedures we've set up uh, in our laws and municipal regulations and just jam it through. I mean, it, I, could, I could wait longer to get a permit for the deck of my house than what is the timeline that's been put out here. I, I feel like it, it makes it more likely that it's not going to succeed. And let's face it, um, if this gets built, it's not going to shut down. I mean, this homeless crisis, you said it, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. We're in a full employment economy right now, and the federal government is spending a trillion dollars more than we have. That's not going to continue. And so the homeless crisis, the ho these housing units are not going to get built in the next year, two years, three years. And so bring us a proposal that's thought out, that's in scale with the community, where we have time to look at it. I mean, we're going to have the same problem next one. Bring us a proposal that's, that's in scale with our community, that's thought out. Let us, let us look at it. I guarantee you this community will support it. But if you rush it through like this and say, well, we don't need to follow the rules, we don't need a permit, we're just going to do this, I, I just don't think it's going to help the chances of success. And then you're going to have other communities where you try to build these things, and they're going to say, well, look at what happened over in Waterbury. We don't want it here. And I just don't think 
is doing anybody uh, uh, any favors to try to jam this through like this. I, I do think Waterbury wants to be part of the solution, but when you do it like this, I just don't think it's going to work. Thank you. And, and I don't envy what you're doing. You have a difficult job. And I appreciate you coming into our community and talking to us, but I really feel like it needs to be done right so it'll succeed. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. I'll recognize Ezra online. Thank you. My name is Ezra. Quick question I had, and I believe this was in the letter, and I'm not sure if this got addressed tonight, but given the proximity of it close to the middle school, my question for the state and to Tom is, um, can we guarantee that there won't be sex offenders uh, placed within that homeless center? I know we talked about disability and mental health issues, but specifically making sure that our kids are not endangered when we uh, know that that's not a good fit and we have a choice of who we can place in the homeless shelter. And then my ask to Tom is that, um, will we hold the state liable if they do not follow that or put our um, kids at risk? Will we legally hold them liable? So we do, um, so we are working with this cohort that's in the hotels that we've been in contact with since June. We've screened them, we know a lot about them, law enforcement gets in touch with us if someone in the hotel system is a sex offender. Uh, so we, we have that information. We would not place sex offenders at the armory shelter. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Rick. I'm a small business owner in town, and I live right in Waterbury. And I think my concerns really are like the rushed along kind of approach. I feel like there's a lot of questions that haven't been directly answered. Um, and I think that there's just a due process to like, we don't have a police force. The ambulance department is stretched thin. You know, like public transportation is not that great and it's cold. And so it's just kind of like when the state tax dollars kind of fade away and we are getting more calls, if that happens, maybe it won't happen. But like, is that gonna fall on the Waterbury community to start kind of picking up the slack there as far as that goes? But furthermore, like, I would love to see this succeed and also like have it be kind of a model for maybe other towns that don't have those infrastructures set up yet. But I think it is important to take our time and to do it wisely and to also have transparency with the director of this facility. Like who is going to be regulating these people that are coming in and coming out? You know, like what kind of background do they have in mental health and with drug abuse and kind of like having a say in like who those people will be? I think in having an open network of communication so that if we are seeing issues, we can go directly to the source instead of having to kind of like just talk about it until nothing happens, you know? That's, I think those are my concerns and I think taking more time and really like crossing our T's and dotting our I's is essential for this to be successful. Thank you. We done. Thank you. I don't know. Yes, I mean. Uh, Rob Dabrowski, uh, I can't help but notice your intro statement is that it's more expensive to do this than putting them in a the hotel. Uh, I know for a fact that you're not going to just drop the ball for these people because it puts their lives at great hardship when you just up and say, okay, we're ending the hotel motel program. And I know you've just extended that mainly for that reason. Um, I, uh, uh, our, our kids go to Cro uh, Brookside. Uh, I know for a fact somebody else mentioned that they have class down in the woods there. Uh, they go skiing there once a week, um, so in the winter time as well. Uh, I've worked uh, for eight months next to a project next to one of these hotel motels. Uh, I know that after the first week, because of all the vandalism and needles and everything else, uh, they had to put up a fence. For eight months, every single day, somebody was out there picking up needles every morning. Um, not to say that everybody, every homeless person is a drug addict. Uh, I have a different experience. My sister was homeless. My sister and her husband were drug addicts. Um, they are almost homeless again. Her husband died uh, from COVID, and now she's living alone with her 16-year-old sister. Support. So uh, infrastructure. Did everybody find parking here today? I'm sure they did, right? Because we have great infrastructure here in Waterbury. No, we don't and we don't have the infrastructure to support these people. My sister is almost homeless again, but we are supporting her. We are helping her every day. Um, it's, it's not an endless thing. Um, so that's what I have to say, thank you. Good 
read on all of us. I've been a resident of Waterbury over 50 years. Um, this is the third time that I've been involved in a change of plans as far as Waterbury is concerned uh, at the state has uh, thrust upon Waterbury without a lot of planning emergency. The first was the juvenile jail that uh, Waterbury stood up to the state and said, you really don't have solid plans to locate the juvenile jail in Waterbury and we've been a compassionate community, community over all these years with the state hospital and continue to be with the patients that are out of the state hospital or the local court of appeals patients. And then came a uh, time when the state overran the number of women at the prison in, in uh, South Burlington. And it was the second time that Waterbury had to stand up and say, look, we, we have taken care of some of the social issues for a long time and compassionate, but this does not match with what's going on here in the community. And uh, at that time, they wanted to put uh, at the state, state uh, mental health facility, they wanted to put the juvenile jail in there, excuse me, the women's, women's jail in there. But they worked out an arrangement with the village uh, for a short period of time to accommodate a certain number and monitor that and make sure it was monitored and reported back to the village. And it, it seemed to work out over a short period of time. Um, I spent two hours this afternoon, uh, I went on Google after hearing last week that the town of Williston was interested in purchasing at some point in time the state police barracks that is operating just off the interstate. And uh, so I went on Google and I said, you know, I wonder if that's the right size. So I looked at the state complex, uh, excuse me, the, st the state facility. Just about 10 more I seconds. At, I looked at the facility, which, which is the armory. And <coughs> just give you this for help. To the and I found out that there's 1,300 square feet roughly at the armory. And then I'm going to ask you to wrap it up, please, the same time that everyone else got. So if you do have a question, you can ask it. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up. Can I see my minute to him? Sure. Yeah. And then you can have 60 seconds. There's there's the existing facilities for heat and ventilating, air conditioning at the Williston facility because it's an office building, um, which does not exist at the at the state state armory. Um, the building is right off the interstate. It's it's within a 400 feet of the interstate, whereas the armory is not. The armory has to go through a neighborhood in order to get to the interstate. Um, the state police is located on the other side of the interstate now, about 900 feet from the old building that they, they located. And that old building appears to be a two-story building, which is a two-story office building. About about a third to a half of it is the state state uh, police, the rest of it I think is fish and wildlife or, or some, some uh, voting registration uh, part of the building. But anyway, that does have heating and ventilating and bathrooms and it does have facilities basically which can be converted, I would think, a lot cheaper than the Army and, and a lot quicker than the Army could be. Okay, converted. thank you so much. That's been three minutes now. Uh, I'll <laughs> pass this around for the, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Al. <laughs> yeah. I'll just take one quick minute here. Uh, Todd Politis, I'm a village resident. And make no mistake, this will be a village problem. This is not a Perry Hill problem. This is not a Blush Hill problem. This is not a Shaw Mansion problem. This ain't a problem up in the hollows. This will be a downtown village problem. I currently live next to the train station. I currently live next to Rusty Parker. I currently deal with the drug, addict, drug addicts in Waterbury. I currently deal with the homeless in Waterbury. It's only going to get worse if we invite this to our town. We have this problem already that no one does anything about. Uh, revitalize Waterbury. One of their amazing, most no notorious projects they did was the train station, the historical welcoming center. The welcoming center is currently closed because we're finding needles and uh, these special clients are sleeping or were sleeping you have 10 more at seconds. the welcoming center. This is gonna be a village problem. I currently deal with the homeless. I give the guys that are in the halfway house right now, I lend them money every week. Thank you so much. The benefits run short. <laughs> I lend them money every week. This is gonna be a local problem, not a problem over the middle. Thanks, uh, Whitney, did you have uh, something to add? Online? 
Hi, Roger. This is Wade Hodge. This oh, is okay. Whitney's husband. Right. Yeah, I think, thanks for having me. I'll try to be brief. Um, I did want to just start by saying that, um, you know, I, I do hope that, um, you know, this program can help some people in need. So, Chris and, and team, I know you're fielding a lot of difficult questions. Thanks for being here. The question I had is, um, has the DCF considered the potential failure modes that might occur? And have you planned for contingencies to address those failure modes um, should they occur? Uh, again, I hope that they don't, but if they do, have you planned for them? Could you give us some specific examples, please? I guess I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, the, what do you mean by when you say failure mode? Well, the things that might go wrong. I, I know that we, um, you know, we want to hope for the best, but things, yep. things might go wrong. Um, I don't know, burglary, trespassing, soliciting, things that just may go awry. And have, have you planned for that? And how you would address that should those those things occur? Sure. So I think those are some of the conversations we need to have with law enforcement. And I know that's started. I don't know how far down the road those have gotten yet. I think. Um, we need to continue to communicate with the town. We need to, we need to speak to the volunteer ambulance service. We need to keep talking to the town government. We need to keep talking uh, to the school district. Um, so that I think, you know, I've said this before, that uh, this has to be an ongoing conversation as we get more details around how this is going to be planned out. Um, but as far as failures, I mean, I think what you're talking about are, are law enforcement issues, uh, our rules of the shelter, uh, reasons why we might exit someone or try to place them in a different form of shelter. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, I think just being proactive in planning for things that could occur would be very important. and planning about how you would potentially respond to those those potential failures that may occur, but doing it in a proactive way and being planful and prepared, yeah. I think is, is kind of what I was getting at. Yeah, kind of take your point. And that's why I think we really want an experienced shelter manager in charge of this um, to be able to do those, uh, you know, someone with the experience to plan ahead for, the, for those sorts of incidents and uh, be prepared for them. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to everyone that came here and those that uh, voiced your questions and the others that just came to listen. I'd like to recognize that we have uh, Representative Tom Stevens here, as well as Representative Teresa Wood. Teresa, the, it's your committee that's been overseeing this. Do you have some uh, wrap-up uh, comments or questions? I do, I do. Um, I'm Teresa Wood, and I. the first thing I want to say is uh, the commissioner alluded to uh, potential uh, change uh, that's happening in the Budget Adjustment Act um, that would extend the deadline for uh, people in the hotels. And the House uh, sent to the Senate uh, a bill that would include housing these folks in the hotels through June 30th. The Senate has a counter proposal. Um, and for this particular cohort that they actually uh, continue that as well. There's another group of individuals that we will have to negotiate about. But I just wanted to be clear with people that the folks who would be eligible for this armory shelter that the commissioners talked about um, are likely to have housing at the hotels until June 30th. Um, that that's, has been agreed to. Um, in theory, um, we're going to conference committee and I am on the conference committee. Um, one of the reasons I'm on the conference committee is specifically around this housing issue. So um, I just wanted people to have that information as uh, a piece of the puzzle that we've been talking about tonight. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks to all for coming out tonight. We are going to move forward with our agenda. We've got some other business to discuss. So uh, thank you, thank you, Tom, Miranda, and Lily. Can you take a two minute break if you like? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, I Pretty close. Pretty close. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to drop on our behalf. Thank you. I'm sure he probably has a list. Me too. No, no, I'm mine. Hey, Kevin. That's great. I can bring you back. I've got a lot of suggestions. I know where the problem is. Good job.
Conversations. I ask that you move it into the hallways. Yeah, you can sit right there. Uh, we actually do have one item before you. Yeah, I found the good fire. I just really agree. Yeah. All right. Call us back to order at uh, 8:54. And the next item on the agenda is the entertainment permit with Good Fire LLP. So, Good Fire representative here. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Come on forward. Oh. Zoom user. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming back. And I apologize that we've uh, had to address this uh, for a couple meetings. So we're a little bit unclear as to whether this was a one day event or a two day event. And some of the happening with parking. I think uh, that's been cleared up uh, in some. I think I've got it. Okay. Um, with uh, some additional information that we've received, um, do you want to have uh, just an opening statement about uh, what the event is about and yeah. how you're preparing for it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're just celebrating uh, our one year of being open uh, in, the, in the town. Um, we're just going to have a little grill out, uh, have some music. Um, like a, a local community to come uh, check it out and celebrate with us. Um, we're uh, trying to be really cautious. We contacted all our local neighbors, um, trying to be strategic about where everything's been placed. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, on Sunday, uh, the 7th of uh, April? Uh, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it, Hi, sorry, you're you, on our screen as a Zoom user. Can you please state your name? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm Bob Owen. I, I am I'm trying to get this phone to work. Bob <laughs> <laughs> okay. the owner of Good Fire, uh, we hear uh, Vermont Good Fire Cannabis, LLC. <laughs> this is Bob. All right. Well, and so, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. So, um, what Ben explained was we're, we're hoping to have a a live music event um, that's going to last um, roughly between 11 and 5. We have um, set up some uh, local traffic control with the state police. Um, we've got the permission of the neighbors. We have a food truck that we'd like to have. Um, and um, we hope we, we've hired a, you know, given if, as long as we get the permission, we're going to 
We're going to have an 80s tribute band, somebody, uh, Phil Bear from Burlington, Vermont, that's going to come down and um, we'll have a platform out there on the lawn and um, with, with um, local police present or state police present, um, we hope to have it up. We hope to have nice weather. Um, and do you have an idea of how many people you're expecting? Um, we, we really don't, but we're trying to do this in, in tangent with um, the, the eclipse, so we know there are going to be a lot of people in town. So we just, uh, I, I did reach out to, um, get, given Karen's suggestion, I did reach out to Dan across the street, and, and Dan uh, gave us the okay for overflow parking across the street. So we're not, we're not at all concerned about parking. Okay. If I might, uh, we don't really expect more than 30 people, really, you know, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, you know, it's a small event outside. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and everyone will be uh, asked for ID as well. Mm -hmm. uh, very small scale. Yeah, I, I, my only concern is that uh, the, the uh, date may influence the number of people that show up. Uh, I've heard people say that we might expect 10,000 people coming to Waterbury on uh, the Eclipse weekend. We already know that there's a lot of bookings in town which are unusual for that, uh, that time of year when ski season is closing down. Um, so you may be surprised and I want to make sure that we don't end up with uh, a much larger problem than, than we anticipate. Um, no. Another concern I have, and maybe you've addressed this with state police, is that that is a busy roadway on any weekend. Uh, and to have people parking over at Cold Hollow and then having to cross uh, the road where there may or may not be a pedestrian crosswalk um, is a concern. So I just want you to address that. It, well, well, yes, it, it, I, I agree. It, so we've got about 22 parking spaces at the store, which we know is not enough. Um, that's that we reached out to Dan. We, we know there, there are gonna be people walking across the street. We, we, we would never consider not doing this without the state police there. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's gonna be in the middle of the day, well lit, um, between, 11 and, uh, between 11 and four. Um, I don't, you know, right out on the lawn, um, I don't really anticipate any issues, you know, in regard to, um, in regard to, you know, traffic. I, I, I suspect that we're going to have a lot of people in town, but I, you know, I think everybody's going to be faced with a lot of, tr uh, tr a lot of people uh, during that weekend. I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be helpful for the community to, to, to get out there and to celebrate this, uh, this one time event. Other questions from the board? No, I appreciate everything. The follow-up from the request from the last meeting was really helpful. I think there was a lot of unknowns, and all the follow-up was really helpful. And then thinking it is going to be a really busy weekend, but it might be really nice to have one more thing for people to go to to spread out, because everything's going to be really crowded that weekend. So adding another place could be helpful with dispersing. But yeah, just be ready for in case it is <laughs> super busy. Okay. Well. Okay. I also just wanted to add a comment that I felt it was very respectful and, and very good taste of good fire to come back to us when we asked them to with an updated plan, with updated mapping. And I thought I went from one opinion to another. <laughs> <laughs> Any other concerns anyone wants to express? If not, do I have a motion? I move to grant Good Fire VT uh, entertainment permit for, is it the 6th or the 7th? 7th. 7th for, the, for April, April 7th, 2024. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Like Just one thing I should have mentioned. Um, I know in the email they put they've contact, copied um, Trooper Regler about mm -hmm. that, but depending upon what's going to happen with the homeless shelter, you know, that it, it could be open at that point in time. So we don't, you know, that could create some issues. But I, I don't want to say anything. I, I think, you know, the state police is probably going to be able to do what they have to do. 
Uh, my understanding is that uh, Officer Riegler may be doing this on his own time. So you go. I mean, he's getting paid by the state police, but it's not his normal work day. He is doing strictly that. Okay. okay, so he's designated. Uh, you know, it, it's a concern, uh, but um, we have any further discussion? No. Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. You have your permit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> All right, next on the agenda is organizational meeting for the town meeting, which will be on the 5th of March. Uh, I'll ask Rebecca Ellis uh, to step forward. Rebecca, you have volunteered to serve as our next town moderator, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. It's an election, so you know, anyone can be nominated that day, but happy to do it. All right. So, um, I, I don't know of anyone else that uh, we have in mind, honestly. Uh, so I'm assuming that we might uh, nominate and uh, move to elect you. Um, and uh, I've reached out to uh, uh, Jeff Kilgore to let him know if that's the way things might happen. Uh, I don't know if Jeff is with us online. That could be him. him. Jeff, is that you? That's the cursor. Oh. Yes. All right. All right. Well, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they both appear to be muted. No. Okay. He's not muted. Maybe the Jeff, is that Jeff. you? Jeff Kilgore? Yes. I guess not. not. All right. Let's move forward. Um, so, uh, I think the way that we've done this in the past is to uh, look at the uh, proposed agenda for the, uh, the articles and uh, then see what the order of the day will be as to who uh, will be saying what. Correct. And I don't know if you shared the motions yet. Uh, Karen. Yeah, put them in the package. Yeah, we have them. Okay. You know, there's, there's a version one that Rebecca had sent. It's very similar to a version that I had done. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, Tom did, and this is the most up to date one, um, Tom did simplify, uh, I believe it was Article 9 this afternoon. Does that sound right? Um, 7 and 9, I just did a dollar amount, too. So if you looked at the packet when I sent you Friday, this varies a little from that. So we're working off of? It, that's, the one in the it, oh, we're deciding that. Got it, got it, got it. I was like, yeah, I'm paralyzed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I guess I should have just done one. But no, it's OK. I didn't want Rebecca's efforts to go for nothing, and I didn't want mine to go for nothing. <laughs> I think the, the most important thing is just to walk through and make sure that you know who's making which motions because if you make the motion, then you have the right to be the first person to speak on that motion. So we just want to know in advance what you need to prepare for. Um, and actually the first, uh, for Article 1, Jeff Kilgore will run the meeting during Article 1 for the election of the new moderator, so you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that. Article two and three are Australian ballot. Um, they're for the election of officers. So there's no discussion of that. So article four is the first one up for grabs. Okay. Well, I was going to uh, <coughs> throw my hand up for article one to uh, huh? nominate okay. you. Rebecca, will he need to nominate you and then you accept the nomination and then he'll also have to move to elect you? That's my understanding. Give you a second. Yes, there'll be a nomination. I didn't cover that in my preparation because I'm not getting <laughs> that part. But well, yeah, if there's a nomination, people say nomination, nomination. Right. And then it'll be, there's only one person who will just cast one ballot. And if it's a vote, then I'll have to show up hands. 
Okay. Um, article two. We do, so there's no motion to be made at all? No, it's Australian ballot. Okay. All right. So then four. That's a pretty easy one. I'll do four. <laughs> Danny? Okay. Um, five? I, I can do five. I did five last year. I think you all felt like it would be awkward to ask for your own thing. <laughs> oh, I was gonna like I was gonna ask who was gonna fall on that hand grenade. <laughs> yeah. Let me just say for articles five for article five, um, there are many towns that don't have that article. Uh, they simply have the voters adopt rates of pay for the select board, and until those are modified, those are in place in perpetuity. Um, it's up to you. Well, well, it's, on the, it's on the warning <laughs> ballot. I'm just saying. It's on the warning now. You can, do, you can do something different now. <laughs> right. yeah. Put a post-it note on the wall and we'll read it. I, since this is my last time to have an opinion about that, I'm going to go ahead and voice it. I like the idea of keeping it. Um, as we saw, unfortunately, with like the town manager, we would often forget about revisiting things like raises or increase in pay or mm -hmm. making sure we're talking about it. And so just having it there, taking maybe two minutes, I feel like it's helpful versus like 15 years go by and we haven't revisited it, so that's all. <coughs> yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable because that gives people, you know, an option to say, no, they should take a cut in pay or no, they should be, you know, pay should be increased. I think that's up to the voters. So I, I like that being on actually a ballot item. Mm -hmm. Okay. So everyone's okay with Karen uh, moving Article 5? Thank you. Article 6. Uh, for Article 6, um, when we get closer, I'll have exact dates to recommend for the installments. Mm -hmm. um, didn't want to have those for tonight, um, just in case um, there's some change on the school front, which is still a little bit up in the air compared to the town. Mm -hmm. But simply traditional dates. Who wants that one? I'd be glad. <coughs> Mark? And just to clarify, are we doing 4.30 after the extended staying late, open late thing? Are we approving at town meeting 4.30 p.m., but the office is staying open till 5 on that day? <coughs> or our previous conversation? I just feel like it's an important one to have clarity on. Yeah. On yeah, the there was a long discussion that at which, like, which time you need to change it to 530. Yeah, and we had a further discussion around methods of payment and e-check, and I felt like the one piece we <coughs> resolved is that town staff are there till 5 p.m. Right. anyway. Well, to be clear, we can still warn it for 430. I just didn't know if the intention of those folks staying later was to offer flexibility. <coughs> that was my understanding. Yeah. So well, what do we think? Is no, no, staff of, no staff objection to increasing the time. So then, can it be reflected? And yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That's this why it's in red. Right? Yeah, 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 that was that was what the question. Was. Also, anything that's in italics here that we're looking at. I mean, this is the, it's, it's the motion that you're going to make at town meeting, so it's not set in stone until mm -hmm. it comes out of your mouth at town meeting. And the second piece, just so people are aware, is I've I've been assured that there will be a challenge to the eight percent penalty. Mm -hmm. It's an annual challenge that comes up. Yeah, <laughs> So should we change that then to from 4.30 to what time? Was it 5 or 5.30? We said 5, and yes, we are going to change it. Okay. You, we said 5? Didn't we? I thought we said 5.30. Oh, God. Yeah, no, we said five, let's call it 5.30. <laughs> I'm going to already change it. Do we say it now? I don't remember. I'm not looking at the minutes from last <laughs> meeting. <laughs> we can read. I mean, you can just tell me to make it the minutes. So you don't have to look right now. Make it the minutes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Match. Because uh, we discussed and minutes. decided. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But you're going to work, you're going to make the motion at eight percent, and you're anticipating uh, something from the floor. A debate. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Challenge. Well, I won't make the motion at 8%, but... <laughs> Mike will, in fact. Okay. <laughs> For someone who's paid the fine. 
Article 7. Article 7 is the hard one. I mean, it's a, it's a <coughs> mouthful. So, in many towns, their version of Article 7 is very easy. And essentially what someone does is say, I move to adopt the budget. And literally, that is it. Um, the budget is and and the, 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 I'd like to review Article 7 with, with council, and in part because um, we also set the tax rate in Article 7, which is based on the budget. Um, but there have been years in the past when the tax rate was not sufficient to meet the revenues needed because the grand list did not grow at the anticipated level. Um, and I think, and, and the tax rate in the end is set by the select board um, not long before bills are issued, uh, right around July 1. Um, I think at a minimum, the motion should say an estimated tax rate. Um, but in general, many towns simply say, I vote to adopt the budget. And then part of the reason, too, is that Article 9 is really redundant mm -hmm. because all the spending in Article 7 is also encompassed in Article 9. So the budget contains the capital funds. Right. The, 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 the other funds transfer to the capital funds. You're already essentially appropriating that. So it, it would be odd if Article 7 passed, but Article 9 did not. Um, so I have no objection to the articles, but the language that is used to, from the four strikes me as a little bit cumbersome and awkward. Um, can, can you have, if there's a budget that's approved in seven, then if there's questions to change the amount in nine, can that be done? That can be done. But, you know, again, the capital funds are embedded in the budget. Right. So it's, it's odd to, it would be very odd to approve one and not the other. Exactly, because so, if you've approved the budget and then you go, you amend it to something else, you have a budget that's really not correct. But that happens either way, right? No matter the right. way. Right, either way. Yeah. Right. Either way. Yeah. Um, well, it's not, that's not how it's warned, so we can say it a different way, right? Technically. <coughs> Why did Bill Shuplock leave when I get to say, I love the flower terms of interest of its inhabitants and prosecution as defense of common rights. So, I was going to volunteer to stand up and say it, yeah. but if we don't want to, we don't have to. Bill, Bill, Bill make that motion. Just one thing. I know that the tax rate got added maybe only a few years ago, two or three years ago. We never set previously set the tax rate. I'm assuming that sometime in the last two or three years, the select board may because of COVID or some other reason. I believe because it was it was uh, Australian ballot during the COVID yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so I don't, that's not traditional in Waterbury to have a tax rate expressed. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, however you um, express it, it's articles 10 through 21. I that's how I was just going to say. And in theory, the capital budget is supposed to be separate from the general fund, the highway, and the library expenses. Though I understand in practice, I think yeah, money is a fun. lot that it gets into. Yeah, it's an it's an odd tradition. It's just you know, money is fungible. Obviously, um, they cannot be separate. But it's, uh, I'm not arguing against the tradition. I'm just suggesting that the actual motion for Article Seven can be shortened if desired. If Alyssa would love to use the flowery language. I'm not going to argue, yeah. and I will simply pencil in the appropriate. I'm not going on the record as the flowery <laughs> language for going in, yeah, though that sentence you know, made me run for select board. But anyway. <laughs> uh, um, run the tape back. Up. I am most interested in this tax thing, because I will say, right, last year, didn't we say didn't wasn't the motion not to exceed 545, so we had to round down when we set tax rate. I guess I, I think having an intentional conversation I, I, about if we want to remove that. I believe, I believe it's. It's appropriate to leave it in because, in the end, I think people vote on a tax rate as much as a budget. Right. But I think it's appropriate to say an estimated tax rate rather than not to exceed. People want to know what the tax rate's going to be. There are a lot of people who are there, they know what tax rates are, 
and that's one thing they're going to be looking at. This they is may even ask run that. on sentence. Right, but uh, you know, again, as uh, Tom was saying, it really depends on the grand list, uh, right. uh, which is a approximate figure. So I think uh, estimated tax. But that's rate why I think it's a good thing to at least put for. estimated, but put a tax rate in there. Okay. Um, you weren't suggesting to take it out. You okay with that, Alyssa? Yeah, I guess I would like it to be a separate sentence then. I guess just to me, the language and that the select board be authorized to issue bills. I'm not an attorney, obviously. We have to have it reviewed for property taxes. So would it just be with a total municipal tax rate on the town's grand list sufficient to beat the budget, comma, estimated to meet? Like the <laughs> authorization we need is to raise the money for the budget that the voters are approving, yes. And we estimate based on current grand list that it will be that. But I just think we need to be clear that we need the authority to raise the full budget. Yes. And then, uh, per Mike's point, I think folks do thing? know numbers. If you, if you make the motion to just adopt the budget, um, I think that's fine. I think when people, if they start making amendments, it's, it's going to, um, people can do this anyway. But they might start really looking at the budget and right. going line by line. You are allowed to do line item mm -hmm. budget <coughs> amendments. So the way it's structured now, it gets a little bit more at sort of the big categories. Um, so just a heads up that could mm -hmm. happen. Happens in many years. People want to take this or that out, and yeah. then you have a discussion. The select board usually will make some sort of you know powwow and say, we don't feel this is a legitimate expense. You know. We'll either go yay or nay that's you know acceptable to us or not acceptable to us and um, the the amendments um, I'm just wondering the form of the amendments because as you say there probably will be amendments so I don't know if the if the motion is to adopt the budget and are you thinking the amendment would be um, less <coughs> twenty thousand dollars for the highway fund or something like that yes. Okay. Um, Right. And that's that's part of the challenge. If people do amend the budget, then we have to redo the math um, on the on the fly, in essence, um, and try to get that right. Um, I'm just suggesting in many towns they use they use rather simple language here, right. and someone simply says, "I move to vote the budget." Show of hands, done. Um, question on amendments too, um, and this this came up in a conversation I had the other week, and I, and I it jolted a memory, but I, I'm not sure. If, what the individual told me was correct, but what I was told was um, you cannot amend a dollar amount in the budget greater than a per certain percentage. So there's like, so I've been doing a lot of meeting on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. There's sort of like this general rule that some people follow of like plus or minus 10%. Okay. Um, it's, Call you know, Kilgore. <laughs> Jeff Kilgore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Hi, sorry about uh, not getting in. Yeah, it happens. We understand. Uh, we're just here uh, with uh, Rebecca Ellis uh, going through the articles. Um, and we started uh, with uh, discussing Article 1, where I said that I would uh, nominate her to. Uh, serve as uh, our t next town moderator. Right. And then uh, I guess it uh, moves from uh, nominations, if there's uh, none other, then uh, we move to a, uh, a motion to elect her. Right. Um, what I will do is I will call the meeting to order and then we'll have the um, Pledge of Allegiance. I'll read the first paragraph of the warning and say, what is your pleasure with respect to Article 1? And I'll read Article 1, and then you'll nominate uh, Karen, and then I'll ask for any other nominations. Karen's got another job. Karen just ran out of the building. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> and if there are no other nominations, I'll instruct one ballot and I'll declare that Rebecca is duly elected and then I'll turn the podium over to her. Okay, great. And then uh, I don't know if you got my email about the uh, Keith Wallace Award. I did, I did, thank you. Okay, uh, so if you wouldn't mind sticking around for another hour or so, uh, <laughs> there'll be a presentation. <laughs> All right. I was planning on uh, 
attending meetings for the first time, not up front. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a whole new perspective and, and for I'm, you. I'm anticipating a lot of uh, points of order. Point of order, please. Not a <laughs> yes. um, no, I don't think there'll be any. <laughs> I guess on the Rebecca, having just volunteered for the budget article indirectly, um, do we make a motion up front to allow Tom to speak as a non-resident? Yeah. I recall in the back in the past having mm -hmm. to stand up when I worked for RW. Yeah. But what would that be one of your What I'll do one? in the beginning, um, following Jeff's script because he kindly shared it with me, is one thing: <laughs> as I'll have everyone who's not a non-resident raise their hand, or remind them that um, they're not allowed to speak unless there's suspension of rules. When it's Tom first wants to speak, I'll say, you know, Mr. Lights is a resident of Cambridge. Um, if there's no objection, uh, he'll be allowed to speak for the rest of the meeting. Hearing no objection, Mr. Lights is allowed to speak for the rest of the meeting. Howard Dean was famously denied that, so who knows? Uh, I might, I might be sent in home. Cambridge, or if there is an objection, where, then I'll ask, you know, somebody to make a motion to suspend the rules to allow him to speak. It's a two-thirds vote. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll be allowed to speak <laughs> anyway. So that's how we'll do it. So the power of the moderator is that I can say to people, if there's no objection, such and such will happen. And I wait a little bit, and if there's no objection, then it's unanimous consent, and that happens. So that's how that will work. Okay. Great. Uh, do we need any further discussion on Article Seven? I think so, the one quick question I have is the ten percent rule. That's sort of a rule of reason. Mm -hmm. Moderators don't have to follow that. Okay. I mean, if it gets wildly, if it's a hundred dollar expenditure and somebody wants to drop it to fifty dollars that's not going to be an objection but if it's a million dollars that someone's going to drop to seven hundred well five hundred thousand like that would clearly be out of order okay so yeah. all right and um you might want to ask jeff if he has any opinion on the flowery language in article seven <laughs> that how it's always been said jeff just turn to that. It's, the motion is usually I'm, I'm moved to approve the town of Wadray sums of money for the interest of its inhabitants and for the prosecution and defense of the common rights. Does that have any special um, meaning? Um, only that that is the language that's in the statute, as I recall. And we have pretty much parroted the statute in that, in that uh, yeah. article. There we go. Well, You'll be consulting with counsel, fine. you said. So. That's fine. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to spend a lot of money on this. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. We're looking at the statute. Mm -hmm. Many towns simply say, motion to approve the budget. Yeah, so, Jeff, Melissa, did you, you going to read that? this one? Yeah. Yes, okay. I'll leave it. And that would be in order, right? To just do a motion to approve the budget? Uh, I think the better practice is to give a number. And that lets people uh, give people the opportunity to amend it uh, more easily. Okay, that's fine. All right. We well, all clear. I'll wait for the final version. Mm -hmm. I'll do eight. All right. We just saw all those fun fire trucks, and I really want to do eight. <laughs> I and Rebecca but, had a legal question. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah, and I just suggested to you maybe to check with you know council or to think about how to form this because um, I don't believe you can vote for a bond in a floor vote that mm. has to be Australian ballot. Yeah, that's oh. correct. So um, it says to borrow up to three hundred eighty thousand by bonds or no. You might make the motion like that and then. You know, if you're not going to use the bond, it's not going to really matter. But you can't use the bond. I mean, yeah. I think you have to make the motion the same as the article. But you're, oh yeah, that but was. But you're authorizing point. borrowing, not <coughs> authorizing that the bond's going to be passed. Can I make a suggestion on that one? Yes. Sure. Um, I would say that you have on the article by to the article says shall you vote by um, bond shall the the money be borrowed by bond or no. And I think as the article says, uh, specifically to be borrowed by note for a period not to exceed five years, then you're all right. Yeah. Well, the article but says But that's not what the article notes. says. No, no, the mo I'm 
sorry, the mo it's a motion set. Oh, okay, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's got some questions. It's got an asterisk that says public safety purposes and then the fire department question mark, but it also says purchase of a fire truck. So I feel like that should be self-explanatory. Those are just notes I made. Oh, okay. I, those are yeah. just Ooh. notes I made how you wanted to word this. I, oh, okay. I, didn't have much I think purchase of a fire truck, full full stop. So if I can interrupt, uh, based two, oh, on the, the reading I did today, right. I Where think your safest set, since you have a very detailed article, is the motion, unfortunately, should follow the, the, the terminology in the article, because otherwise. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at the other one. Challenge yes. for not providing proper warning. So, Kane, mm. I think we're, I mean, um, Karen can do this in the next sure. draft, but it should basically say everything that's in that article. And then next year, when you write the article, you might write the more simple. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But if you have a complicated article, you should probably follow it. Okay. Yep. And did you have any comments on that one? Um, um, from the fire department's point of view, on it, I, I will be there like I am every year, yeah. and certainly every time we have a truck in question, if people have questions, I can certainly answer. Great. Okay. So, do you want to Wait, real quick then look at Rebecca's version? Yeah, yeah, that's what I just showed. Was <laughs> he wasn't looking at that. I was looking at your version. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, okay. But yeah, look at hers and see if you like that language yeah, better. Right. Okay. Is yours in in light of what you suggested? Rebecca, is yours more in line with the language? Training has no. Yeah, I kind of like that language better. Yeah. Okay. I think the one thing is I took out. Wait, you took out the word bond. Yeah, I took out the word bond, and then and I was wondering maybe I should have done that. It's. But. Council wrote the article, um, and he basically said. Um, he writes them all generically, so no matter how they appear on the ballot or the warning, they're all valid, basically. But you're right, if, if, if it's just, you're right on the legal terminology. How you, how you phrase the motion is, um, I think, subject to some discretion. I guess I'd also just throw out, given that it's been warned, we tend towards wordier language this year with an acknowledgement <laughs> that will try and create a less wordy warning mm -hmm. less next time. year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Article 9. I'll offer to do that one. Thank you. Between the versions. Do you not pay any debts on the capital? <laughs> Uh, we do not. Okay. They're, all in, they're all in Article 7, embedded in those costs. Awesome. That's a, a Gasby rule that changed a couple of years ago. So. Yeah. Is there an issue if we paid debts from the capital funds? Or? No, it's just that I noticed in previous years we had that language because mm -hmm. yeah. we were paying debts from the capital mm -hmm. fund. Yeah. Not that we should be paying debts from the capital fund, but if you aren't, then you don't need that language. Okay. Article 10. <coughs> I volunteer. Strong I pick all those special Ooh. articles. Mm, nice. Uh, Jeff, do you restate that whole article and then repeat it again when there's a vote? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, that's subject to some comedy at the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right. you, <laughs> you might need filler time. You could yes. skip it. I think I asked because I wanted him to read it. No, no, they didn't want to read it. Oh, so you did skip it. Yeah. Okay. I, I asked for their permission and they graciously granted you to skip it. <laughs> All right. Where's the end rule? That's it. Legion. Um, it's on the ballot, um, but not I in the warning. I was wondering on the last article. Separating. <laughs> The, um, the crew one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was that somebody from the public is making that one? Public bill. Oh, what? I'm sorry, there's two conversations. It was included oh, sorry, originally. Our, it's our I guess I would say to speak to intent of 21 as it is reimbursements and not in the budget, I think our goal was recognizing it might not be binding, but to capture our intent. 
in a more formal way. <coughs> so oh, yeah, led to it on the right. um, as opposed to like in a budget or elsewhere. And is it Bill who's going to do it, or you don't know? I believe it was Bill who was going to. Bill, it might be Liz. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Bill or Liz, because they're like the <laughs> primary crew people. Liz probably will not wish to speak at town meeting. She's going to be busy oh, with right. me being up on the oh, okay. so stage. Probably so Bill would, I'm yeah. sure Bill would be willing to yeah. state a motion if so asked. Actually, and I think he did ask for the motion at one of our meetings. Oh, yeah. That's correct. Well, I just feel like we, as a board of ownership, did agree to put it on. So, like, if, if no one speaks to it, I speak to it. But I agree. But Bill, then we Bill can speak to crew more compellingly But then we want to change, if there's an actual motion, the wording in Article 7, because uh, it says 10 through 21. Yes, we call that. Right? But do you want to take out 21? No, no. Oh, you yeah. leave it, and then leave someone it. still makes an effort. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think um, Alyssa's point is. Oh, heard. Got it. I, you know, I it's not really in the budget, but. I was just slow catching up. Understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So I think. Mike had suggested at one time, not only did I leave out to everybody who had a special article for things like a table, well, yeah, you know, place where they could place literature. Um, I have not done that outreach yet. So now's a great time for me to decide, am I reaching out to the individuals from articles 11 through 20? I'm asking them to come to the meeting and ask for their money. I agree. I think there should be a I think I feel like Steve Lott's speech was always like heavily. Steve, Steve covered a bunch yeah. of them, but Steve's uh, not going to be here. Right. Um, so if that's if that's the wish, then I can certainly do that. It's at least worth to ask someone to say, again, if there's a worthy organization, someone who knows something about it is probably going to speak toward it. Yeah, and you should make sure the organizations but, know they should find a Waterbury resident. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is hard for me to picture that a representative of the American Red Cross is going to show up at Waterbury Town Meeting. Well, GMT too. But no, but you have someone who's, I'm sure, a volunteer what for happens Red Cross. Is so or something. I'll read the article and then I'll say, What is your pleasure? And there's a long silence. And then finally, somebody from the audience just raises their hand. They make the motion just to get it. Got it. Considered. It'd be nice, like Red Cross has like a volunteer in Waterbury that yes. they send them up and gotcha. make that motion. Alex Collins. Alex, Alex Collins will make it. Georgiana, Birmingham. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if Margaret Luce is still making a lot of motions. It's usually. Used to be Steve would be make a bunch Steve of motions. Steve, a lot of speech nights. Thank you. So um, I did have a question. Is there going to be a lunch being served? Yeah. Um, I, last year I reached out to the senior center yeah. and they came into the lunch and I haven't made that same outreach. I don't have confirmation. Okay, so we don't know. I don't know. Okay. I can follow back up. I, it, the contact I have is the bookkeeper and she admittingly is not the cook, so she wouldn't mm -hmm. commit for them. Um, so I can reach back out. That's actually a good reminder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also have um, childcare. Oh, yeah, that was my yeah. Yeah. I, I can maybe at Waterbury oh. find out tomorrow if we're going to have it at the, uh, we always have it at the senior center. And Justin will be there, so sure. he's, he's the chair. He's the okay. board chair. Yeah, if there is, so if the meeting's going yeah. long, this is the complicated thing for lunch, is that, like, if we've got only five, ten articles left to go, even ten, like, I won't want to break. Right. If I want to finish the meeting, so if it's going to 1 or one thirty. It's difficult for the people to lunch. <laughs> Nothing I need to tell you. We'll try not to take an actual recess for lunch. I can go downstairs and eat. Just not yeah. 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 Having yeah. gone through this last bagels. year, there have been, there've been enough lapse in time between when the senior center was used to doing it to now, or last year, mm -hmm. that no one seemed to know how it used to be. Um, but they did a great job. They came and set up in the cafeteria downstairs, and um, you know, it was an opportunity yeah. for them to 
make a little money, and but the meeting did not go past noon last year. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. probably it won't. But just in case it won't. Well, ever since the school board got switched to a different day, it wasn't included <coughs> as part of the meeting. That's what we recessed for lunch. Because right, right. um, right. that's when you'd have both the school meeting as well as the, Understood, you know, yeah. town meeting, and it, it never, it was definitely, you would, meetings were usually ending about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then the other breaks that we normally do is um, allows Tom Stevens and Teresa Wood to speak. Mm -hmm. right. And they haven't told me yet when they want to do it because they try to hit yeah, several town right meetings. Um, and then I don't know if John Malter will want to speak again. Mm -hmm. He will. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want trash talk? Mm -hmm. Do you want I'll, trash I'll, talk I'll, this I'll, year? It's my to, favorite one line. <laughs> I'll speak to John tomorrow about the rotary. Um, All right. He might. He doesn't do it on the budget. Because do we give? I'm thinking one of the They don't. Well, they don't. No, they don't. They get an appropriation. And then, just so you know, normally under Robert's rules, people are allowed to speak for ten minutes. I He's in the budget, Alyssa. He's I not will, a separate the warning, but yeah, he that's does. what I thought. So I don't think I will um, mm -hmm. tell people there's a time limit. But if people are starting to go long, you might want to make a motion to suspend the rules, to um, limit the amount of time that people can talk for the rest of the meeting, you know, like mm -hmm. three or five minutes. But I don't, I don't think I'll do that at the beginning unless mm -hmm. you want me to. I mean, if you want, I can say if there's no objection, all um, speeches should be limited to five minutes or something like that. I would do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think we have that many controversial yeah. ones that are going to go long. You don't, don't say that. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I think a suggestion. I, I'm, 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 I'm talking yeah. about like the, uh, the, the small I think five minutes should give people ample not, time not to say what they need right, to say. That's the hard thing, huh? Right. I'll put that in. And then um, uh, the uh, skip one to recognize the uh, ambulance service, uh, 50 years of service to the town of Waterbury. And uh, especially uh, have a motion from the select board to recognize uh, Sarah White's 50 years of service to the ambulance. Sarah Uttons. Sarah Uttons. She was a white. She was a white. Now she's yeah. not. Okay. So, <laughs> so it can't be a motion because you don't have an article, so it would right. be out of order. Uh -huh. So I don't want you to make a motion and then we have to tell you it's out of order. <laughs> yeah, right. I think it'll just be, you'll come down from the stage and just say, we'd like to say a few words. And okay. Start. All right. Yeah. <coughs> all right. One and, and that'll be the same time that we'll then do the. I, I uh, think we'll do it all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other process question. Um, it's not in the warning, but does should there be a plan to give an armory update? A town meeting? A, a, a town oh. meeting. You can do it on other business. <laughs> other business. Well, Jeff yeah. had a question, actually. That was Jeff's question on his text was bring it that mm -hmm. there's no other business. That was what I was getting to. There's no other business in the warning. Uh, you're, you're, you're out of order if you don't uh, do it. Uh, out of order. I think I'll just announce. Take which part Jeff, that's okay. You know, we'll just say we're going to have other business. If nobody objects, we'll just have other business. Obviously, well, not obviously, but anything um, discussed or any motions made under other business are not binding on the select board. But I think it's usually a good practice to let people make comments on whatever they want to comment on in town meeting. And then the, okay, the second, um, second question I had for the board is, um, so I like the idea of having um, a few department heads come in. I know the manager traditionally gives the budget presentation and I would do that, but I'd like to have um, Katarina come in because she's new and because we're slowly, but it feels like inexorably working towards a bond vote for some recreation facilities. And um, I'd like to have Rachel come in because the library has a pretty significant budget change. So I thought those two would be appropriate if there's no objection. Just leave that to the presentation. Well, totally Rebecca would need to know that they're both not Waterbury residents. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, under Article 7, you have them speak? Because maybe what could happen is there's a question about um, rec the recreation or library. 
Rachel came last year. She was in the audience. I mean, yeah. she attended the full meeting. If there were to be questions and there were not specific library yeah. questions, I'd call like out. To have so I guess in my mind, it's the proactive presentation yeah. versus. I'd like, I'd like to have Rachel and Katarina give short, proactive presentations. Um, and they're interested in doing that, too. Totally agree. Yeah. We'll do the um, meeting you're presentation and then say, and I'd like to ask my recreation director, whatever her title is, to speak to recreation. And then I'll say, um, you know, Katerina, I can't remember Katerina's last name, but anyway, you know, is resident of blah, blah, blah. There's no objection. You know, she'll be allowed to speak. And then, okay. and then when she finishes, you'll do the next thing you'll set up at the half. Rachel, Rachel speak to the library. We'll do the same thing of saying, resident of blah, 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 no objection. She can speak. I think that moves on swiftly. Good. Do you remember who made the, did you make the budget motion last year, Roger? I did, no. And did you, I guess, I'm thinking that of your structure of just regarding like preamble. Oh, once again, Bill Shublik is not here, but it's like, it's the board's budget, speak to the budget. Obviously, we want Tom and the, the department heads to speak, so I'm just thinking around, obviously, I will make the long flowery motion and, you know, speak in a, a you know, three or four sentences that we're all comfortable with, kind of regarding our process. I'm just, I'm, I'm. Do you recall specifically how detailed you were in kind of your? Did you make any remarks beyond reading the motion? I all I just okay. said was that uh, I had reviewed the budget and that I uh, wholeheartedly support it and recommend it for passage. I don't think I said much more than that. I think I complimented uh, Tom uh, for <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. keeping it uh, affordable. Yeah, I think, you know, from the select board's point of view, if there's something in particular that you discussed while you were developing the budget, like you were trying to keep it to a certain tax rate, or you had specific initiatives that you wanted to make sure are included, I think that's good for people to hear, like that that, that mm -hmm. was the select board's input into the budget. Short is also always appreciated. So. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you took the time to thank Bill and introduce Tom mm -hmm. based on my notes. Yes. Oh. I have a question. Um, I know it's going to be controversial, but and the only place I could see is being done in other business because it's not binding. Because I'm sure people are going to have issues with the school budget. I know we're in. That's all Australian ballot based, and they have their information meeting the night before. Do we want to even address the school budget issues? Could they do that under under other business? Well, that's what I'm saying. So I I don't know if we do, but I'm I wouldn't be surprised that may come up under other business. Yeah, they can. Uh they can talk about the, they can talk about the issues effective. that are on Australian ballot. Right. Um, and I was just looking at Article <coughs> Three. That's just um, the director. So I don't think it would be germane under Article Three, but it no, it, it would be under other business. Yeah, it would be Or they could go to the school board meeting the night before. Or run a right in the lab. Yeah, or yeah, it was crazy. I think, though, Mike, just to give my two cents, I think my general feeling is like I would feel pretty weird if the school board was making commentary on our budget, not at our meeting, at their meeting. So mm. to the extent no, some... No, I'm not saying... Uh, yeah, no, I know, and I just wanted to clarify that. So but, I think but if I'm someone brings it up, obviously I don't think someone can should, bring it up. We like, should cease debate by residents raising the issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they're free to, to address it. So we're not act not to beat the horse. We're not actively bringing it up. It's just allowed if people want to if talk so about right. it. <laughs> that would be my yeah. okay. At the meeting, I'll say you know if there's any other business um, that the body would like to discuss, now is your opportunity. Okay. Right. Perfect. <laughs> Oftentimes it comes up in the budget conversation. Right. People just say, oh, the school is going up so much, we should we should not pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Um, feel free to.
contact me if you have any questions about parliamentary procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing about substance. Um, but of course, <laughs> um, also for the general public out there, or if you are talking to people that have questions about how to raise issues at town meeting, I mean, that's the role of the moderator. I'm happy to work on it, happy to, you know, write things down for them so that they can properly raise issues um, or mm -hmm. make amendments. That's my job. And you know your speech on Robert Charles right. Mapple. I know that, well, I know it because Jeff gave it to me. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not memorized. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know if I know Jeff could have had that down fast. <laughs> yeah, and I'll have Jeff there, you know. If I ever need to take a recess, please be at ease <laughs> while I consult with my parliamentarian. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for doing it. Thank, yeah, you, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. We'll see you Jeff, there. Thank you for You're welcome to, to stay this. with us. Uh, the mm -hmm. next uh, item on the agenda will be the uh, Duxbury Moortown Fire Protection Contract. Or you can sign off. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Look forward to seeing you on the film. Good night to you all in town meeting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, so there's actually... I didn't notice it until now. There was a little typo in the agenda. It should have said Duxbury and Moortown fire protection contracts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and I wrote Duxbury Moortown. That's okay. Uh -huh. so that's all right. We, we got that's both the, of the water girl in me, I guess. <laughs> both of these have been provided to those respective boards as drafts. Um, the Duxbury contract is, it's a, all the language is standard. I did notice on the first page, which I'm asking for signature on, there's a, Karen pointed out under, under line five, it says 2021. It's based on the current grand list, not 2021. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, I had raised an issue with the board for a number of years, for the last four or five years, our grand list grew a little faster than, than the portion of Duxbury we cover, and so our respective portion didn't go up as much. That trend completely changed this past year. Uh, so it's not broke. I'm not going to try to fix it. <laughs> um, so the total cost of Duxbury um, is up about $6,000, which I think is pretty reasonable and pretty consistent with inflation, actually. actually. Um, and Moortown, um, Moortown is a really small piece of Moortown. Um, the 36.43 is based on the dollar amount last year, plus 3.5%, which was inflation. Sorry, plus 3.35%. Um, so they're both um, really exactly the same as, as prior years just for, for cost. The, um, now, the simple way to think of it is um, our fire budget last year was about 862 grand. Um, you know, we're getting 127 back. Um, so something like one seventh of our fire budget comes back to us. So that's the same with the new truck. Uh, eventually comes back to us in a, a pretty reasonable share. So um, I'm sorry, if I'm supposed to print one that says 2020. That's okay, because that's that's the other page. It's not the signature page anyway. But. <laughs> if you send it to me, I... <laughs> so nothing different from prior years. Um, haven't heard from those towns after I sent the dress that they have any objections. Mm -hmm. And in fact, since I've been here, they haven't expressed any objections. Everything's been fine. Um, there was a board member who expressed some objections a few years back um, and suggested that... Um, the board member of Duxbury has suggested that Duxbury doesn't need to pay Waterbury because we're going to respond anyway. Um, but but that's not mutual aid; that's automatic aid, which is something different. Um, so Gary, I think Gary and the manager, I think at the time went to a Duxbury board meeting and set them straight. <laughs> so there haven't been any issues since, to my knowledge. They were kind of prodded by somebody else, and they essentially said, "Well, we'll just have somebody else get there." And then he called for Waterbury, um, even though they didn't have any fire apparatus there. And that is not mutual aid. That is not in the spirit of mutual aid. And that is not any agreement that Capital Fire Mutual Aid has. That would be automatic aid. And that is totally different. Um, essentially, that's like contract. Mm -hmm. And you can't do it without a contract. Would I not respond to a house fire? Of course not. But that becomes more of a a political issue as opposed to me. I'm, I'm not going to make that decision. I'm just going to let you hammer it out afterwards. But that is not mutual aid when somebody just gets there and says, oh, water, we'll just call Waterbury every time. It's not what it's about. And they were receptive. I mean, it was, there's been a couple moves in my 
20 plus years and certainly longer before that um, where people have tried to say, oh, to Duxbury, here, you, in fact, one person said, here, I will sell you this fire truck. You can put it at your highway garage and then you can say you've got a fire department yet nobody's going to respond and you can just call water and it's mutual aid. That is not the spirit of mutual aid. <coughs> Do you need a motion? Uh, Mike, just a question and it's probably a stupid question, but why is Duxbury two installments and more town one and one's at the end of the year and one's split between mid-year so, and just tradition, and I suspect it's because I, well, that's why I you know, Duxbury is a small town without a lot of government apparatus, and I suspect this is a pretty meaningful part of their budget. Okay. Um, that's that's the only reason I can I can provide, but it's it's been yeah. that way for some years. The only reason I kind of asked that because they have a first payment due in May. You would think with more town being such a small <coughs> amount that theirs would be in May, so you know we'd make a little interest on on the money over the course of the year. Just a thought. <coughs> Any other discussion on this? Do you need a, a motion for this? I need, a, I need oh. a motion to approve them, and then I, we can pass around a, okay. one for signature sign. And then we'll go to them, and of course, they've got the other uh, I make a motion to approve the fire protection contract as written for the town of Doxbury. Right? Is that what Second. I said? Yeah, I think during yeah. the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I was just doing one at a time. One yeah. at a time. Okay. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? All right. That's free as approved. Do you want me to do it again? Get right. All right. <laughs> I move to approve the fire protection contract as written for the town of Moortown. Seconded again. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. <coughs> More town is also approved. And I can, have you already started signing over there? No, no, we didn't. We have a date. We have an edit. Oh. Well, the, the edit's on the first page. So okay, so sign it back. You can sign the back side yeah. with the edit. Oh, well, I'm changing the year. Start? I have um, not started yet. I didn't start. I have black pen. I wrote on mine also. So and we need to be witness, Karen. I also <laughs> wrote on mine. <laughs> <laughs> I have a clean one. Alyssa has one. I have a clean one too. <laughs> I guess you have more to say. Do you come up here and practice Sing a little song. singing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> next on the agenda is uh, the next meeting agenda. Ooh. <coughs> Who Which will we be have sitting in my seat? So in my tenure, so that was cool. That's true. I've never seen an organizational meeting ahead of time. <laughs> All right. So the organizational meeting is set for Monday, March 18th. Just and run it over. have a draft agenda. <coughs> and I don't know if it'll be reviewed, but I did send uh, Karen and Alyssa um, a draft, some draft updates to the Animal Control Ordinance. I think I got that out Friday. So now we're already talking about the 100 on 100 again. Mm -hmm. so we could add that. Uh, always good to talk about animals on the first go around. <laughs> I just went from 100 on 100 today. Mm -hmm. um, that event isn't until August. So I told him I would put it on this agenda as a placeholder, but it can definitely be approved. Next meeting would probably be a good time to talk about eclipse parking. Mm, that's a good plan. Yeah, <laughs> that might be more timely. Mm -hmm. Are we open? My other would be, do we need to approve the minutes of town meeting, or is that and at town meeting? I never forget to remember the procedure. The number of which? The minutes. <coughs> we approve the minutes from town meeting yeah, at I this, along with the minutes of tonight. Yeah. Let's add that. All right. Um, did you 
hear anything back from Liz about uh, the crew flood fare? Uh, not yet. All right. Well, I guess we have time to see if we want to add that. Something. My impression was that we wanted to get that uh, going fairly early in this year. And, um, so we. Everyone agreed that we'll take a hundred on a hundred off until uh, subsequent meeting. Move uh, clips parking up. Animal control up if it's available already. That's probably safe to assume there's going to be some type of armory update, right? <laughs> By March 18th. I think so. yeah. yeah, I mean you got a week so, until holding a little space. April. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I don't know if we want to do a, I don't know that it's been past practice, but maybe after the 755, like, debrief of town meeting, just in case there's anything that feels noteworthy. So I know we did it indirectly and in a responsive way last year, because there was some omissions pointed out, but personally, I feel like mm -hmm. <laughs> as a board with at least some of us coming back and a budget that hopefully has passed and things, a 10-minute reflection. What, was, what were the omissions last year? <laughs> The Pledge of oh, Allegiance and the town band. <laughs> that was my. Sorry, nothing. Technical. I thought you were kidding. Nothing, that was I want to be honest. Nothing technical. That was the warning. Yeah, her, um, yeah, no, nothing no. serious. That was my first meeting when uh, when you all got chewed out about Tell not him, doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Band. The band. Yeah. I just and like and last year we the, had Henry, uh, the Keith Wallace Awards. Right, and last year I guess we also had conversations about like accessibility. Thank you, Karen. I'm thrilled that we have childcare this year. Yeah. Like I'm just saying things like that, or the lunch. And if it did or didn't work, I just feel like we're going to be best poised to capture that in a 10 minute debrief yeah. at this meeting. And if it's on agenda item, time. public might have input at that time, and it's a good time to do it. Versus, as happy as I was to get childcare, I was way happier to see the school schedule is closed on November 5th, 2024. <laughs> so all the stars have left. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Huge win for Waterbury. Huge. <laughs> Great. Right. So you want to add like a ten minute briefing? Uh, to after brief a, debrief. Yeah. Just, just, just say like quick. Re, yeah, quick review of town meeting. Brief debrief, whatever. Love a brief debrief. Uh, and you want to do that before the introductions and process questions, or after authority for tax anticipation? Think <coughs> makes sense. Um, why don't we do it before? Okay. We'll do it right after the public. Because uh -huh. the public will be there still. I guess one other question is uh, if there is a uh, armory update of uh, interest to the greater public, uh, do we want to do that <coughs> before uh, we spend the better part of an hour on introductions and process questions? Make uh, people learn about it. <laughs> yeah, that would be happy. Well, if you do armory update as we've done, before everything else, after the consent agenda items and after the public and you throw armory update in there, by the time we get to everything else, nobody wants to be there. True. Yeah. Some, of, some of us have to be. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I just don't think it's going to be uh, making people sit through all this other stuff, which doesn't really concern them directly. Uh, might be a little challenging. <coughs> They'll probably get a lot of the armory update at the end of town meeting. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. I think I okay, think questions. There's gonna be a lot of people answers, there, so right. I think I think it's gonna come up. Why don't no, we put I don't the armory that. update uh, at I the just, very end? You know, I, I think we actually did get some some reasonable answers tonight. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. yeah, yeah we did right. uh, gotcha. at the last session. Right, and that's a full month. This is a full month away, so yeah. All right. Do what you well, think is we best. Can, we can yeah. we can sort some of this out. But anyways, those are those are some of my issues. Okay. Town meeting after after town meeting, we can figure it out if we need it. Control. Yeah. Let's see who's left standing. I didn't even know last last time was my uh, last right. steel room meeting. If we're okay with uh, this discussion on the uh, next meeting on the 18th of March, I will entertain uh, a 
motion to adjourn. motion executive session is that what we're doing? To <laughs> executive session. Uh, we've got a yeah. oh. <laughs> I'll volunteer. I'll, I'll read it. I need to know what it is. Do to <coughs> go someplace else? To no, I can just move to the waiting room. Yeah. I can open up the corner office. Yeah, we can close this. Whatever's uh, easiest. For whatever's easiest. <laughs> yeah, whatever's easiest. Yeah, they yeah, have to pack probably up. Probably makes also. sense. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Corner Thanks, office. Thanks, Gary. I've always wanted you. a corner office. You want to get a motion before we go? Yes. <laughs> what is it? I'm on it. Here you go. Here you go. Oh, really selfish. You got to do one and then A for contracts. Okay. Uh -huh. After making, wait, do I start the motion before? I. <laughs> the first motion will be the premature knowledge. I move to find that premature. I move to find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage in regarding to contracts. <laughs> With regards to contracts? I second that that puts the town of Waterbury at a substantial Thank you. disadvantage. With I did my regards best. To contracts. Um, Wait, but we have no, to vote on this. Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. 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 Since we have those findings, I move that we enter into executive session. Second. Good enough. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Look, I've never done it before. I just wanted to do it for my last time. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Maybe it's just blended in.